I uh, understand the secretary has a hard stop at 12.30, and so uh, the committee hearing is called to order. I want to thank everyone for today's attendance uh, on oversight uh, of NEOE's FY20 budget proposal. And I want to welcome the Secretary of uh, NEOE, Secretary Perry, back to this subcommittee. Uh, Mr. Secretary, NEOE's FY 2020 budget requires, requests rather, $31.7 million, a $4 million decrease from FY 2019 uh, that was enacted for uh, the level in 2019. And it includes extreme reductions to some critical programs, federal investments in clean energy program, power grid operations, next gen energy technologies, and economic development for tribal communities are drastically decreased in your proposal. Important departments such as the Office of Energy Efficiency and Renewable Energy is reduced by 86% from FY 2019 levels, with the vast majority of these cuts, more than 700 million coming from energy efficiency programs. Additionally, the Budget proposal was slash the Office of Science, which funds the 17 national laboratories by $1 million from the FY 2019 enacted level, while also eliminating the Advanced Research Programs Agency Energy, um, RPE, in FY 2020. Mr. Secretary, as you can imagine, many of these proposed cuts are non-starters as far as I'm concerned, as these uh, reductions would severely impact federally funded investments in clean energy research and development, harming our economy and global status as leadership uh, wants in these particular areas. However, another issue, Mr. Secretary, that I want to discuss with you today is the dire need for federal investment in workforce training to help put thousands of Americans uh, to work in good paying jobs and careers. Mr. Secretary, just last month, Brookings released a groundbreaking and eye-opening study entitled Advancing Inclusion Through Clean Energy Jobs. Some of these key findings in this report found that employees in clean energy jobs earn higher uh, and more equitable wages than all workers nationally with mean hourly wages topping the national average uh, by 18 by 8 to 19 percent. The study found that clean energy jobs provide tremendous opportunities for low-income workers to increase their salaries by earning up to five to ten dollars more per hour compared to other jobs. Despite higher wages, the study found that many clean energy jobs actually have lower 
educational requirements were close, were close to 50% of these workers holding only a high school diploma were earning higher wages than comparable peers in other industries. Mr. Secretary, I look forward to hearing uh, from you today uh, as we discuss these and other important issues. And with that, I yield back and I recognize the ranking member of the subcommittee, my friend from Michigan, Mr. Upton, for five minutes. Well, thank you, my friend and chairman. Secretary Perry, welcome. Uh, there is something about the Department of Energy that brings out enthusiasm about our nation's energy and environmental future. And I think you demonstrate that enthusiasm better than just about anyone who has ever led that department. And I welcome that enthusiasm and look forward to your testimony, obviously, this morning. You know, over the last decade, we have emerged as the world's leading producer of oil and natural gas. And at the same time, we're also the world, we lead the world in CO2 emission reductions, a fact that proves that energy production and environmental protection are not mutually exclusive goals. So today, we are more energy secure than at any point in our nation's history. Fifteen years ago, we thought that we were running out. And I believe that we owe this dramatic turnaround to free market competition, American ingenuity, and certainly technological innovations that were driven in part through, re through research conducted by the DOE. Our energy abundance is supporting millions of American jobs and strengthening our economy, while at the same time providing our allies with a stable and secure new supplier. U.S. energy exports, especially LNG, have also have the potential to help drive down emissions, which gives our trading partners another reason to do business with us. The shifting patterns of energy supply and use both here in the U.S. and around the world present both challenges and opportunities. I bring this up because the energy revolution represents a new economic fact of life for us. More communities are reliant on the supply of natural gas, for example, as more utilities use this energy for electric power. This raises another important issue for the department, which is the core mission to ensure the reliable supply of energy to the public. In recent years, we've worked with you to address electric grid electric critical infrastructure security, including cyber, to make sure the DOE has the statutory authorities to protect and respond to risks in bulk power systems. And I commend your continuing focus on that mission, which you demonstrated in your formation of the Cyber Security, Energy Security, and Emergency Response Office, CSER. One area that is particularly concerned uh, to most of us is the nexus between natural gas pipelines and electric generating units. So I'd like to understand this morning what DOE is doing to assess risks in energy systems, particularly security and cybersecurity risks that threaten the supply of energy to our electricity systems. And while pipeline safety and security certainly falls under the jurisdiction of other agencies, DOE maintains the prime responsibility for ensuring the supply of energy, so it is important to understand how you address these risks. This work on energy security also involves what happens in an emergency. What happens when there's a major disruption at a major event that impedes the supply of energy? The Caesar office addresses this, but you also have offices under other department components that assist state energy offices. I'd like to get a sense of your priorities for working with states and territories to ensure that they have the information and tools to respond in emergencies. In the last Congress, committee members moved several bills that would have helped strengthen your authorities to coordinate and provide technical assistance to other federal agencies, states, utilities, to help strengthen our defense against attack. This is an area that this committee will continue to press. In Michigan, the electric power system is moving to more renewable energy. In fact, we'll be at 40% by 2040. For this to work economically in the long term, technology is necessary to continue to drive down costs and to enable the reliable supply during peak electric demand. And I'd like to understand how your budget aligns DOE research priorities to address the needs for cleaner electricity system. Finally, Mr. Secretary, there are other important priorities that are gonna help our country develop and deploy the new clean technologies. As you know, one area of interest for this committee concerns nuclear energy, which provides one of the best paths to reducing greenhouse gas emissions. We've done a lot of work in this Congress. We intend to do a lot more, 
And on, the, on this point, I'd much appreciate your budget proposal to include some funding to restart the defense of the Yucca Mountain license before the NRC. Before the NRC. I'd also like to note that we have competing subcommittees meetings uh, this morning, but we are missing our good Texas colleague, Mr. Olson, who went back uh, yesterday to look at some of the storm and flood damage in your great state. Again, Mr. Secretary, welcome. We look forward to working with you. Yield back. Chair sure, now recognizes uh, the Chairman of the Full Committee, Mr. Pallone, for five minutes for his opening statement. Thank you, Chairman Rush. Um, let me uh, thank the Secretary for appearing here uh, this morning. I do really appreciate your being here, but I'm still frustrated and disappointed about the fiscal year 2020 Department of Energy budget because it is largely the same what I call out-of-touch document that we saw last year. The, the drastic cuts contained in President Trump's budget last year were rejected by Congress, and I expect that to be the case again this year. So rather than talking about a budget that is essentially dead on arrival, I'd like to discuss several energy policy issues, um, including energy efficiency, legacy site cleanup, nuclear waste, and cybersecurity. Unfortunately, the department's track record on efficiency standards for consumer products is not good. Since the beginning of the Trump administration, the department has ignored 17 legally mandated deadlines to finalize efficiency standards for common consumer appliances. And rather than updating those standards, DOE has spent its time working to discard light bulb efficiency standards. And this rollback will lead to years of unnecessary electricity generation and carbon emissions just to power inefficient and outdated light bulbs. It's unclear who benefits from this, absent a handful of light bulb manufacturers. In fact, uh, the electricity generators uh, support uh, the light bulb efficiency. In 37, electric utilities sent a letter to DOE last week opposing the light bulb rollback. And they know that efficiency improvements reduce the need for new infrastructure and improve the reliability of the existing electricity supply. I'm also concerned about the department's environmental management program, which is tasked with cleaning up the legacy waste sites where nuclear weapons were developed and built. The oversight and investigation subcommittee held a hearing on DOE's growing environmental liability just last week, which as of this year has climbed to a staggering $377 billion. The GAO highlighted serious mismanagement at these sites and included the department's mounting environmental liabilities on its high risk list. Now, I recognize that this is a problem you did not create, Mr. Secretary. Unfortunately, the president's budget makes your job more daunting by cutting the environmental management program by over 700 million from last year's level. And this is concerning, and I hope we see better management of this program moving forward, and we wanna work with you to accomplish that goal. We must also find a solution to the storage and disposition of commercial spent nuclear fuel that currently resides at our nation's nuclear power plants. Each year, more nuclear power plants are ceasing operation. Until we come up with a federal solution to this issue, that spent fuel will be stored on site at those plants which no longer generate power. And this effectively freezes any efforts to redevelop those sites. So we need interim storage solutions to bridge the gap until a permanent repository is licensed and constructed. And Mr. Secretary, I hope to work with you and my colleagues on both sides of the aisle to give the department the authority it needs to store this spent fuel at interim storage sites until we can permanently dispose of it. I know that both the Mr. Upton and, and Mr. Rush uh, you know, are, are similarly concerned. Another area where I know we can work together is cybersecurity. I'm troubled by the report last week that earlier this year there was for the first time a successful cyber attack on our electricity system. It was not a sophisticated attack and thankfully no consumer outages occurred, but that might not be the case next time. Our country's energy infrastructure is critical. We must ensure our nation's electric system as well as the associated dams, railways, and pipelines are all protected from an attack. So I am concerned by a recent GAO report I commissioned that found the Transportation Security Administration's pipeline security program has troubling weaknesses. At a hearing we held on pipeline safety and security last week, GAO informed us that TSA has only four employees to oversee the security of our nation's nearly three million miles of pipeline. 
And that's obviously unacceptable and frightening. So I support legislation introduced by Ranking Member Upton and Representative Lobsack that would allow DOE to develop a program to establish policies and procedures to improve the physical and cybersecurity of our nation's pipeline work. And I hope you work with us to enact that bill as well. So again, uh, Mr. Secretary, thank you for being here today. And with that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Chair now recognizes the ranking member of the full committee, Mr. Walton, for five minutes for the purposes of an opening statement. Good morning, Mr. Chair, and morning. thanks for having this hearing. Good morning, Mr. Secretary. Welcome back to the Energy and Commerce Committee. We're delighted to have you here. The Department of Energy's $32 billion budget proposal serves as a reminder of the broad range of defense, science, energy, and environmental activities that your agency pursues to perform its really important, critical, I'd say, national and energy security missions. The breadth of DOE's responsibilities is impressive, Mr. Secretary. DOE's work, which is conducted here in Washington, D.C., and at national labs and field stations across the nation, includes maintenance of our nuclear weapons, support for international nonproliferation programs, and nuclear propulsion work for the U.S. Navy. It includes the cleanup of Cold War era environmental contamination and management disposal of spent nuclear fuel and high level radioactive waste. DOE also supports cutting edge early stage scientific research at our 17 national laboratories, including PNNL, which uh, you and I got to visit in 2017. It establishes efficiency standards for appliances and equipment, conducts energy related research development and demonstration across all forms of energy and technologies. It maintains the Strategic Petroleum Reserve and exercises authorities to respond to energy supply disruptions and maintain the resilience of our electric grid and pipeline systems. DOE also provides central, aid, central energy data collection and analysis through the Energy Information Administration, very valuable data for our public policy work. Managing this portfolio, as we all know, remains a challenge which is why I believe it's so important to stay focused on DOE's core missions. During your time at the department, Mr. Secretary, this committee on a bipartisan basis has sought to ensure that you have adequate resources and the statutory authorities required to align, manage, and fund programs to cost effectively execute the department's missions. Today, I hope you can update the committee on the progress you've made modernizing the Department of Energy and the challenges and opportunities that you see going forward. Just a week ago, as you heard earlier, our oversight subcommittee examined the DOE's work to address environmental liabilities and what can be done to accelerate cleanup and save taxpayer money. This is of particular interest to me, as you know, given the Hanford site across the Columbia River from Oregon in my district. You and I saw firsthand the vast scope of the work that remains, and I'd like to hear from you on how you plan to accelerate the cleanup at Hanford. Hanford, as with other major cleanup sites, initially provided for our nation's defense needs. In fact, over time, it fostered technological and scientific capabilities that continued to benefit the nation on energy, environmental, and security matters. The Pacific Northwest National Laboratory was established as an R&D complex at Hanford for the Manhattan Project. Now it serves a broader range of missions for the nation. This technological and innovative capability that now threads through the department's labs and field sites provides the tools for addressing future energy and security challenges. You can see this is the tremendous advance, see this in the tremendous advances in DOE supercomputing capabilities that we talked about yesterday. Originally developed for weapons work, DOE supercomputers now promise tremendous advances across the agency's missions and national priorities, from carbon-free fossil energy to helping cure diseases. So I'm excited about the potential to utilize DOE's advanced computing to support the next wave of American innovation. Now, when you testified before us last year, Mr. Secretary, the committee had been moving legislation that would help DOE enhance our energy security, spread the strategic benefits of our nation's energy revolution, and further drive our, uh, our drive to reduce emissions. For example, we worked to streamline the export of LNG and nuclear technology. We sought to enable future innovations that would lead to more reliable modern electric grid. We sought to increase DOE's capabilities to prepare and respond to emergencies and uh, to in, in, including from extreme weather events. We sought to ensure DOE is able to develop the infrastructure for advanced nuclear energy currently being pursued by companies such as New Scale in Oregon and others. So I must say I'm encouraged by the work your, you and your team are doing in support of transformative breakthroughs in carbon-free fossil energy, carbon capture technologies, advanced nuclear energy efficiency, advanced energy storage technologies, 
and modeling for increased energy resilience, all to lower greenhouse gas emissions and help consumers get affordable power. I'd like to understand how DOE could more effectively support innovation, how it can help bridge the gap between the lab and commercial development while minimizing taxpayer risk. What can DOE do to attract and harness private capital to help accelerate deployment of future clean technologies? I also uh, look forward to learning about your priorities to enhance DOE's capabilities to ensure the reliable delivery of power given ongoing threats from bad actors. So, Mr. Secretary, how we harness DOE's incredible capabilities to support future energy innovation, security, and public interest given going budget constraints will be our focus today. But I look forward to uh, working with you on this and so much more going forward. With that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. I want to thank the uh, ranking member uh, for yielding. And now it is my uh, responsibility to introduce our witness for today's hearing, uh, the Honorable Rick Perry, who is the Secretary of the United States Department of Energy. Mr. Secretary, we certainly want to welcome you to the Energy Subcommittee. And we all look forward to your testimony and eagerly await your participation. Uh, in this hearing. So uh, now I will recognize the Secretary for five minutes for the purposes of an opening statement. Mr. Secretary, you've been here countless times and you are well aware of the lighting system, so we don't want to take time to explain something that you already know. So with that, uh, uh, we recognize you for five minutes an opening statement. Mr. Chairman, thank you very much. And to the members, thank you all for uh, your, your kindness and, and hospitality. Uh, those of you that have had the opportunity to be in your, uh, in your offices and, and what I have you and in your districts as, as we go forward. And Mr. Chairman, you've been so kind as uh, members of both sides of the aisle to allow us to show you a brief video that I think will be substantially more interesting than me going on here for uh, a minute and a half. But if I could, I'd like to Direct your attention over to the... Hear no objection, so on. Yes, sir. Thank you. Energy independence used to be a soundbite, but now it's reality. Curtailing it would erase today's great economic gains and environmental achievements while limiting tomorrow's innovative solutions to our biggest challenges. We're determined to lead the drive, lead the drive for cleaner energy in this world. And we'll do it without surrendering one single fuel, one bit of growth, one iota of opportunity for this nation and for the world. I see people in our national lab forging ahead with action. It's through innovation that you all are achieving the results that we all want. And together, we can transcend these divisions. We can bridge the energy poverty gap, we can secure a future of cleaner energy. So as we look to the future, I know that despite our challenges, everyone in this room is as excited and as optimistic as I am about the incredible potential of the new era that we're entering. This is the new American energy era, and it will move us forward bringing unprecedented benefit to the world, unleashing greater innovation than ever so that sovereign nations can share in the prosperity, the freedom, and the security for generations and generations to come. Mr. Chairman, again, thank you for the opportunity to, to show that. I think it, um, Mr. Up, you talked about uh, um, I reflect a lot of excitement about uh, the energy department and the men and women who work there, the technology that comes out of that, and you're absolutely correct. This is, you all have heard me say this before, this is the coolest job I've ever had in my life. Uh, and I might add, uh, uh, Mr. Ballone, this is the most interesting job I've ever had in my life. Not the best, but um, the, the most interesting. So anyway, to, to each of you, uh, it's my privilege to be uh, before you today and to 
um, to respond to the 2020 uh, budget request uh, for the department. Uh, the budget is a request to the American people uh, through you, the, the representatives, uh, in Congress to secure America's future through energy independence, scientific innovation, and uh, national security. Um, as I've already said, this is an exciting time. Uh, exciting time to be the, at the helm of, of DOE. Uh, it continues to be a great privilege to serve as the 14th Secretary of Energy. Uh, look forward to working with uh, each of you uh, as we go forward, passing a budget that invests in uh, the nation's priorities in energy and science and uh, national security, while at the same time continuing uh, uh, our shared support of innovations that have led to America's um, world leading, yet open, often overlooked uh, progress in, in reducing uh, energy related emissions. When I appeared before the committee last year, I, I committed to rebuild and restore our nation's security uh, to, to protect uh, our critical energy infrastructure from cyber threats uh, to improve the resilience and the reliability of the nation's electrical uh, system, to invest in early stage, cutting edge research uh, development, <clears throat> uh, to advance our leadership in exascale and quantum computing, and to continue to seek a federal storage repository for the nation's spent nuclear fuel. And, and concerning that last point, um, let me thank uh, each of the members of, of the committee, uh, certainly on both sides of, of this aisle, um, for uh, you joined us in, in, in searching for a solution to, uh, to deal with the, the waste disposal needs. Um, I'm proud to report uh, that since last year, DOE has advanced each of these goals that I just cited uh, by investing in, in reliable, affordable energy, transformative innovation, national security. We're approaching the dawn of, as I made the re uh, reference to in that film, the new American energy era, uh, a time of energy abundance, security, and yes, even independence. Uh, this past fall, I fulfilled a commitment to visit all 17 of the national labs uh, and I got to witness firsthand the brilliant uh, work that's Mr. performed by these dedicated professionals. Mr. Secretary, I must say that you're on a hard uh, deadline, a hard... Yes, sir. So when you, when you conclude... Rock and roll, sir. I'm listen. ready. All right, all right. <laughs> sir, when... No, sir. No disrespect, but you're on a hard, I'm, I'm, hard I'm, deadline. I'm working here. for you, sir. All right. Uh, and that concludes the opening statements, and... Uh, I want to recognize myself for five minutes for the purposes of asking questions of our witnesses. Mr. Secretary, as you may be aware, the energy workforce overall is currently nominated by older white male workers, and this is also true within the clean energy sector, as women make up less than 20% of workers in the clean energy production and energy efficiency sectors, and less than 10% of these workers are African American. Many of the recommendations for addressing these disparities are included in my workforce bill, H.R. 1315, including a focus on STEM education, aligning education and training with industry needs locally and regionally, and increasing apprenticeships and on-the-job learning. Mr. Secretary, within the past month alone, there have been three different studies that have been released discussing the need for a younger, more diverse, trained workforce within the energy sector. And there was the Brookings study that I cited in my opening statement, uh, a report by the Solar Energy Industry Association entitled Diversity Best Practices Guide for the Solar Industry, and an alliance to save energy study entitled Growth and Energy Efficiency Demands Investment in a Highly Skilled Workforce. Mr. Secretary, during your time as Secretary, have you personally heard from these, from companies rather, within the energy sector regarding their dire need to find 
uh, trained workers. Are you aware that the energy workforce overall is mostly comprised of older white men and that many sectors are looking to diversify their labor force by going into previously underrepresented communities? Do you believe that it's worth federal investment to support initiatives to accomplish this goal? So, uh, Mr. Chairman, um, I, I'm, I am glad that you are excited and, and kept us focused on uh, this issue of the potential in the clean energy sector uh, in, the, uh, uh, in, this, in this country. And according to the Bureau of Labor uh, Statistics, solar installers and, and wind technicians are projected to be two of the fastest growing occupations in the U.S. as, as we go forward and, and leading uh, even the projected growth and demand for healthcare professionals. So I, I think it's you're, you're spot on in your focus on this and developing that workforce. And uh, American Wind Energy, uh, uh, Mr. Vesey, who uh, is from my home state, he knows the work that we did together to expand the, uh, uh, the wind energy in, in the state of Texas. It produces more wind than uh, all but five other countries. And they're in, Incredible impact into those rural areas where that showed up, and then obviously the jobs that get created and, and what have you. Uh, it, it is a major job creator in America today. There's over 105,000 U.S. workers who have wind powered careers. All 50 states are affected by this, and uh, I think there's 242,000 U.S. workers that are employed in the solar. Uh, side of it. So uh, that, that's just good news, and we look forward to expanding that. 90% growth in the solar side in the last two years in this country. So, uh, you're so, uh, so you, you, you would think that this would be a priority for federal investment to. Yes, sir. Okay, yes, sir. thank you. Uh, Mr. Secretary, both the majority and minority sides have been in touch with your agency about obtaining data on the funding levels for workforce programs that the department currently conducts. I understand that your staff has been working vigorously to get us that information, but I really wanted to know uh, and to remind you that we're still waiting to hear back from you, and it is important to understand that this is indeed a priority for members on both sides of the aisle. Will you commit to this committee that uh, you will make sure that we receive the data in a yes, timely fashion. Yes, sir. And, and, and we, we have a couple of programs of which you've been briefed and your staff's been briefed on. Um, the Equity and, and Energy is the, is the name of the new program. Um, it was called Diversity and Energy, but we've, we've changed it over to Equity and Energy, and you'll have those, uh, that data, and, and we're working hard. Uh, and, and just as a, an, an addition, Mr. Chairman, uh, these X-Lab uh, projects that we're working on, where we bring the private sector into our national labs. As a matter of fact, I think there's one coming up in uh, uh, Argonne. Uh, you'll obviously have a little more than a passing interest in, in, uh, in Argonne because you, you're, you're, you're home of residence there in Chicago. Uh, but anyway, it's an artificial intelligence and machine learning uh, project that's going to be working there in the early fall of 2019. So we obviously will invite you and your staff to be there as, as we do that. But it's a great opportunity for us not only to showcase the clean uh, jobs, but also uh, to recruit those young uh, men and women, uh, a, a, a diverse workforce, and, and maybe, you know, prick their interest in science and technology, engineering and in math, to bring them into uh, a, a future uh, that's going to be not only exciting, but obviously a, a great opportunity for them to better their lives. Well, thank you, Mr. Secretary. Uh, the chair now recognizes Mr. Walden, the ranking member of the full committee, for the purposes of questioning the witness. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to thank Mr. Upton, too, for yielding. I have a meeting I have to get to down at the White House. So, but Mr. Secretary, um, thanks again for being here. Thanks sure. for your leadership of the agency. Uh, we work with a number of uh, presidential appointees on this committee, and uh, you're one of the best we work with in terms of communication with your team and uh, going back and forth with us on these energy policy issues. Now, there's one you and I talked about last year, and I think probably the year before and everything else, and it should come as no surprise related to the proposal to sell off the Bonneville Power Administration. 
um, and the idea of selling it off. So the question is, the idea of selling off Bonneville Power Administration's electricity transmission assets and abandoning cost base rates is broadly rejected by practically every member of the Pacific Northwest congressional delegation in the House and the Senate. Can you assure me the Department of Energy will not sell off BPA unless Congress provides explicit authorization? I can assure you with great uh, assurance that uh, we will follow your direction, sir, and, and this committee, and Congress's direction. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. Now, let's move on to innovation. Um, I note this past week, DOE announced a contract to build the Frontier Supercomputer at Oak Ridge National <coughs> Laboratory, which is anticipated to de debut as the world's most powerful computer. Can you talk about the research benefits of DOE's supercomputer program? If it, that, that will be difficult in a short period of time, but I'll do my best in the, in, in here, and I'll talk fast, uh, which is a pretty good test for for an, Aggie, for an Aggie, but <laughs> the, uh, the, the, the breadth of, of what these supercomputers are allowing us to get answers for uh, of, of questions that have vexed us in the past, and just because we did not have the computing capacity, uh, we didn't have the broad uh, the, the bandwidth, if you will, to put all the data in to get the, uh, the answers back. These computers, here's the speed of which they are, um, a billion billion calculations per second. I mean, I'm, I'll be honest with you, I can't get my little mind around that, uh, the, the ability to manage that much data. But it, it, it gives us uh, the potential in healthcare, for instance, to be able to find some cures for cancer, uh, to, to go back through every uh, data set that's been done in, in, since time immoral on drug test that ended up over in a, in a, in a pile of, uh, because they were failures because we couldn't get to the final answer. Go back and take all of that data and run it through these computers because they are so powerful and we will find new drugs uh, to, to, to work on. In brain science, and, and this is where um, Mr. McNerney and I were talking about, I know his interest in traumatic brain injury and, and the work that uh, is being done there. We're in a partnership with the University of California, San Francisco, Dr. Jeffrey Manley out there, uh, finding new solutions on traumatic brain injury, post-traumatic stress, CTE, uh, which uh, obviously the, the professional football league is very interested in, 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 uh, in some of those studies. I mean, and, and that's just in the healthcare side. What can you say about energy? Can we get to where coal can be burned with no emissions? And, and here is, here's my example, uh, Mr. Chairman, is that, you know, 15 years ago, people told us we'd found all the energy that there was to be found at the, you know, just get used to it. We right. found it all. Even if you find any more, you won't be able to afford to produce it. Well, that conventional wisdom was massively wrong. I will suggest to you those that say you can't use coal, for instance, in a clean, uh, almost emission-free way. They can be proven wrong, too, and it's going to be these supercomputers that are working with our scientists, and I will suggest to you at the private sector and our national labs uh, in, in partnership to find some energy solutions to this incredibly abundant resource that, that we have in this country. So you're absolutely correct. But let me go to a different topic, if I could. We've spent a lot of time in this committee looking at nuclear waste storage. We appreciate your leadership in this, and we hope to renew that effort going forward. But also um, at how we harness new nuclear energy technologies. And so I know that the, the department's looking at uh, doing some work on micronuclear, as well as uh, some of the other proposals, new scale and others. In the 20 seconds I have left, can you just give us a quick update on yep. small modular and micro? Yes, sir. Um, the, the work that's being done in the agency, along with the private sector, uh, INL, Idaho National Lab, uh, and uh, uh, New Scale, uh, they're, they're in a partnership out there. Um, I know uh, uh, Mr. Gates, uh, Bill Gates, and, and, and his company, Terra Energy, they're, they eat different technology, but these small modular reactors and these micro reactors, the micro reactors even smaller. The uh, bill from the standpoint of using these in our uh, in our military and and, um, and in places around the world. So, and the small modular reactors also not only are they smaller, they're cheaper. Uh, 
uh, they're easier to build, and they're safer, and the fuel that they use is safer. So the, the, the future what? of clean energy uh, has never been brighter than it Can is Can you give today. me the horizon? Are we talking two years, 10 years, 30 years? 2025, uh, if I'm correct on, on that number, 2025 is the projected date on uh, some of the SMRs uh, to be out with their prototypes. And um, All right. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for your indulgence. Chair, the Chair now recognizes the Chairman of the Full Committee, Mr. Pallone, for five minutes for opening statement before questioning the witness. Thank you, uh, Chairman Rush. Um, I wanted to go back to the light bulbs, Mr. Secretary. You recently proposed to rescind rules that would extend 2020 light bulb standards to the full range of bulb shapes and sizes commonly used in U.S. homes. And the effect of your proposed rule is to take back a standard that would save the average U.S. household about $100 per year, and by saving electricity would deliver very large reductions in carbon emissions. And the comment period on the proposed rule closed last Friday. So can you tell me how many comments you received in support of this proposed rule and who submitted comments in support? Mr. Chairman, I will get that information to you. I don't have it at the tip of my... Um, but if I, if I may, can I respond just to kind of share with you what we're doing? And well, I, look, I, 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 you can get back to me with the, with the, um, with the comments. Um, I mean, I have something that was prepared by staff that gives us some information, like a summary about it. So I wanted to discuss that if I could. Yes, um, but if you would get back to me in answering Absolutely. that previous question, I appreciate it. Now, the, the summary I have, and I'm not going to introduce it for the record because I'd rather get your actual official document if we could. But while the department has been slow to get all comments posted so far, those opposing your rollback so far include more than 40 electric utilities, the U.S. Climate Alliance, which includes Republican and Democratic governors from 24 states representing 60 percent of the U.S. population, and a wide range of consumer advocates, energy efficiency groups, and environmental groups, and also 15 state attorney generals have opposed the proposal. And to date, again, I, I only have the information so far, to date the only organizations on the record supporting your action are the light bulb manufacturers and their trade association. So you have more than 15,000 citizen comments so far have been filed with the vast majority opposed to the rollback. So again, Mr. Secretary, why is it that at the same time that DOE has missed 17 congressionally mandated legal deadlines for updating a wide range of appliance standards, the department is spending scarce time and taxpayer money on eliminating standards for light bulbs that will save consumers money and cut carbon emissions. Why is it that you're so intent on going backwards on the light bulb efficiency? Why has this become a priority? Mr. Chairman, I, I think this, the, the bigger issue from my perspective is that um, the, the, the challenge with the way that the statute is written, and um, we're, I will tell you, we're working hard to meet our legal obligations on this, but uh, the, the deadlines for issuing regulations and, and uh, uh, whether it's you know, appliances and, uh, or equipment. And I've instructed the staff to develop a plan uh, to address the, the missed deadlines. Um, and that plan is in the forthcoming uh, spring unified regulatory agenda. But so, you see, Mr. Secretary, no one, I mean, I only have a, a limited amount of time and, you know, I appreciate your being here, but no one seems to agree with your proposal, not the utility industry, not the 15 state AGs, not consumer advocates. As far as I can see, the only voice supporting your action is a handful of companies that want to keep on selling outmoded, grossly inefficient light bulbs that are a bad deal, bad deal for consumers and harm the environment. So I, 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 I just don't, I don't agree and I don't really even understand your argument. Um, but anyway, let me move on to the uh, LNG, Mr. Chairman. We only got a minute and a half here. Last December, DOE determined that liquefied natural gas export volumes to non-free trade agreement countries equal to 52.8 billion cubic feet a day, a volume equal to 71% of U.S. demand, is not is inconsistent with the public interest under the Natural Gas Act. And DOE also stated it intends to approve LNG export applications of those countries up to this volume. 
And then DOE has also approved LNG export volumes to free trade agreement countries equal to 58.1 billion cubic feet per day. And my understanding is that LNG export application approvals for periods of 20 to 30 years. My concern with this, because we're running out of time, is that there is, um, is the impact of these approvals on domestic supply and pricing. That these approvals, you know, are going to, you know, have a greater demand for more pipeline infrastructure. The communities and landowners bear the cost of building out the support for this enterprise. Uh, have you ever denied any export application for LNG? Has any has has the not just you, but has the DOE ever denied an export application? Uh, I can't speak for. Uh prior uh, administrations, but I can assure you that we have not, and uh, if, if, if I'm still the Secretary of Energy, we will not, because we have the most massive supply in the world, sir. Uh, the issue, if, if the question here is there's some folks over in the Northeast that are concerned about the, 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 the availability or the cost of natural gas, it's got a lot more to do with the uh, inability to build a pipeline across uh, New York, for instance, to get into uh, the Northeast than it does with our supply. The American natural gas producing uh, regions of this country, uh, and we've only seen the tip of the iceberg. That's not my quote, that's the quote of the International uh, Energy Agency head, Fatih Barol, last week when I was in the EU, telling the Europeans that we have, uh, we have more gas than they can purchase. So I would suggest that this country is really blessed to have this low uh, emissions, this clean burning fuel, and being able to build the infrastructure out across this country so that all Americans can enjoy uh, that, that fuel. Uh, the folks in, in, in the Northeast are paying 40% more for their residential and 60% more for their commercial electricity because of the inability to move that natural gas uh, in, into those regions and then use it uh, and I didn't even talked about the so, yeah. negative effect on our environment because of the fuel oil that's having to be burned instead of natural gas. Mr. So, yeah, we have a lot of members who want to ask questions. Yes, sir. So when you need a little bit more succinct with your answer. Yes, sir. All right. That one I'm just really passionate about, sir. Yes, I understand. But you, you have a hard deadline. Yes, sir. Chair and I recognize the gentleman, the ranking member of the subcommittee, Mr. Upton, for five minutes. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'd like to get through three questions if I can. A number of decades ago, I, I worked for President Reagan, and I can remember him when he signed the Nuclear Waste Policy Act of saying that this was going to be the bill that actually resolved the issue, uh, certainly within the next 20 years. We're now 40 years later, and this committee, as you know, voted 49 to 4 in the last Congress, widely bipartisan. To, to move John Shimkus's bill, uh, which we passed with a, with a pretty good margin on the House floor. For us to finish the job, uh, the one thing that we really need to spend money on, I think, is to complete the licensing process at the NRC. Can, do you agree that that's the case, and can you commit to trying to help us uh, get to that final final stage? Yes, sir. That, I mean, if, if, you don't, if you don't have the permitting process uh, finalized, then you're not going to, th this is your, this is your, your, this is a map of every one of those red states has uh, waste. And that's, that's your plan. That's the, the repository for America. And if that's why we have to complete the licensing process. Yes, sir. We have to if get we that don't done. finish that license, and, and listen, I'm not a yucca or bust person. I, I'm, let's find a solution to this. Yucca is one of the solutions, but if you do not have a permitting process that is finalized, you are never going to be able to move this out of your states, and there's 38 of them here. Your states are going to be the ones that are the, the final that's solution a good answer. for this. That's a, that's a good answer. We can go to the Jeopardy, double Jeopardy now. All right. Um, there was a report earlier this week, a public report, that uh, disclosed that a cyber attack in, on March 5th, uh, I don't know if you saw this story, the CyberTAC 202, CyberTAC just disrupted grid operations in the U.S., but it could have been far worse. Recently disclosed hack in an electric utility in the western U.S. crossed a disturbing new line. What can you tell us about that a couple months later? 
Well, we received the report about a denial of service condition that occurred at Electric Utility. I think it was on around the 1st of March of 2019. And the, the incident did not impact generation, uh, the reliability of the grid, or cause any customer outages. Uh, we were in contact with that utility, and uh, they're, they're managing the incident coordination with with their firewall manufacturing, so any lessons learned from that experience? Um, well, yeah, when you get uh, when you get uh, a direction to put a patch on your uh, uh, on your firewall, you need to put your patch on the firewall. I mean, it's pretty it's pretty simple. Uh, they made an error, and uh, so uh, one, trying to reiterate to the utilities, no matter what their size, is that when you get a directive to to uh, protect your firewall, you need to do it. And are you working with EEI to make sure that they pass that word along to all their yes, member companies and, as well? And the subsector uh, coordinating council, uh, the folks that uh, that deal with these these issues and, and our counterparts, if you will, on the private sector. Yes, sir. So, as you know, we're currently working, I think, on a pipeline and LNG facility cybersecurity preparedness act. I've introduced the bill HR three seventy which codifies some of what DOE is currently doing on the coordination side and by authorizing R&D and pilot demonstration projects. Uh, has the department looked at this bill at all? Can you offer some support, some guidance in terms of what we need to do to make sure that we diminish any threat of cybersecurity attack on our nation's pipeline system? Yes, sir. Obviously, um, you know, we'll give you any technical in, uh, information, any technical help that we can on uh, on developing it and, and whatever you all um, decide we're going to implement. But, the, um, you know, we, we'll be, we're, we're coordinating uh, and um, working with any threats that are out there, um, best practices. I mean, we, we, we manage the, uh, the information flow with the private sector, I think, in a fairly um, a positive way in a fairly transparent way and, and to mitigate uh, the um, any of the challenges that we've got some best practices the uh, investment incentives the cost recovery practices in the energy sector uh, pipeline security we touch all of those and I think we're you know I, I, I think we've got a for pipelines and the electrical grid uh, I think we've got a, a good flow of information and we're as, as on top of this as we can be. I appreciate your leadership and I yield back. The chair now recognizes uh, Mr. Peters from California for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Secretary, for being here. You know, last year um, we had a, a similar uh, hearing where uh, we were critical of the um, president's proposed budget. They cut out, cut a lot of things and I think um, uh, you were candid that some of this was not your idea, um, and ultimately we were able to restore some of the investments I think were important. Let me make two observations about that this year, and then I had a particular question for you. First is on ARPA-E. Um, the Trump administration's continued to attempt to fully defund ARPA-E, which is the basic research component of the Department of Energy. It just doesn't make any sense. It's inconsistent with your own um, initial video that talks about innovation. I think we, we'd all like to get behind that. Uh, one of the largest ARPA-E grants ever awarded was in my district to a company called Acades Power. Uh, they successfully developed an opposed piston engine that creates more power with lower toxic emissions and increased fuel efficiency. And it's such a, a great advance that it's now on the way to being the future engine of many US Army vehicles. Um, and I don't think you dispute that that was an important investment for the country. Um, it's not the kind of thing we want to defund. Uh, second, with respect to carbon capture, um, as you may know that I introduced uh, the Use It Act with my colleague from West Virginia, uh, Mr. McKinley. Um, there are an example of a West Virginian and a Californian working together on energy and environmental issue. I think that's a good idea. Uh, it focuses on the need for increased investment in carbon capture utilization and sequestration technology as well as, as, well as direct air capture technology. The International Panel on Climate Change, IPCC, has said that carbon capture is going to have to be part of any strategy to get us to net, to net carbon uh, zero by mid-century. The Department of Energy, your own handout here, says that you want to reduce the cost of carbon capture utilization and storage. That's great, but the commitment is not reflected in a 65%
cut to CCUS in this budget. I'm not asking for a, a, a response on that other to tell you that it's obvious that it's inconsistent with your goals, Mr. Secretary, uh, as they're stated. But I did want to ask you a particular question about um, subsidies. Earlier this week, the IMF, IMF uh, updated a working paper on global fossil fuel subsidies, reported the annual global subsidy for fossil fuels at $5.2 trillion. The United States contributes the second largest portion of that behind only China, subsidizing energy efforts that are not part of our sustainable future. According to the report, quote, removing those subsidies would lower global air would lower global emissions by 28% and deaths from air pollution by 46%. It's my understanding that the amount that the DOE proposed to subsidize fossil fuels is $489 million. Is that your understanding? If that's what your numbers show, sir, I don't that's, know that off the top of my head. It's but just I, from the handout. Yes, yep. I, and I would, I would just ask you, how is it appropriate for us to subsidize parts of the fossil fuel industry that are so mature is that really the right role for government? And I'm asking you as a, as a rock rib conservative Texan, is there, does that really want to use some money to government taxpayer money to subsidize a mature industry like fossil fuel yes, extraction? Here, here's what I see, sir. I, I see the United States and, and our fossil fuel industry, particularly through the development of our uh, natural gas that then turned into liquefied natural gas. Uh, we drove down the emissions in the state of Texas by a substantial margin. I'll just give you the numbers quickly. 60% on SOX, 50% on NOx, almost 20% on the carbon dioxide side of it. In the period of time from about 2007 through 2015, while I was the governor there, that while we were leading the nation in the creation of jobs and wealth, I might add, that occurred because of the transition that we did from old and efficient power plants to clean burning natural gas. So I, I will make the statement, and I think I will stand by it, that the, uh, the, the tax incentives, the other ways that, that they calculate a subsidy of the fossil fuel industry, that will have a, a massive amount of impact as American LNG goes to Europe uh, to take out old, inefficient power plants and transition away from uh, coal plants in, in Germany, for instance. So I think that the, uh, the, the, the tax subsidies that occur to continue to get uh, American uh, technology into these countries and American natural resources like our LNG is absolutely a good investment of our tax Mr. Just so we're not confused, I'm not even talking about the tax subsidies. This is direct spending on subsidies out of the Department of Energy. I, I still support and them, I, sir. And I would say I, that from my perspective, and I think if, if you look at your goals, to be able to spend $489 million you know, on ARPA-E, which was $366 million last year, is a lot more cost effective, and I yield back. Chair now recognizes Mr. Nolato for five minutes. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and Mr. Secretary, thank you very much for being with us today. Good to have you back. The Department of Energy has important responsibility to secure the nation's energy infrastructure against all hazards, including severe weather, to reduce the risk of potential cyber attack, and to assist with energy restoration and recovery efforts. DOE's newly created Office of Cybersecurity, Energy Security, and Emergency Response leads these efforts. And I'd like to kind of follow up uh, on the ranking members' um, questions uh, a little bit on strengthening. Uh, and I know you talked about the situation with the patch that should have occurred, but would you talk about your efforts to strengthen the nation's uh, energy infrastructure against cyber attacks? Sir, sure. um, that, that is the reason that the CSER office was, uh, was stood up. We saw a, a clear, the, the Department of Energy is the sector-specific agency uh, dealing with our electrical grid. Uh, we obviously work with our partners at DHS and at the transport, U.S. DOT on the pipeline side of it too, but the the SCADA systems and and the um, the uh, cyber security aspects of which were um, you know, cyber security is an integral part of of energy uh, security, uh, and and that's assessing the risk, the vulnerabilities that uh, occur both by natural disasters and by man-made. So it, it's it's not all about uh, the uh, the man-made uh, attacks, if you will, the, the viruses that get put in place. This is also about how are we going to deal with hurricanes? How are we going to deal with uh, uh, 
a polar vortex that comes in and knocks out, uh, how you manage and have this diverse portfolio. Uh, I think one of my jobs is to make sure that Americans understand that if we don't have this base load uh, of electricity out there that is 24-7 that you, the, and, and frankly, on site, which is basically either nuclear or coal, uh, because all the others are interruptible in some form or fashion, but I think it's a good to have that conversation with Americans uh, that if we had a, uh, a triple whammy, if you will, if we had a po polar vortex and we had a cyber attack uh, that, that, that occurred at the same time, along with a physical attack on a pipeline, how that could massively affect the, the Northeast, for instance, the city of New York with the millions of people that live there. So we want to make sure that Americans know, number one, that we have the, uh, the, the technical uh, ability to deal with this, uh, that we're, uh, you know, very good at uh, analyzing and, and blocking the attacks that come, and we keep our private sector uh, partners advised of this, and, and we have a number of uh, our utility, uh, private sector utility types that come in that we have the ability to brief them on classified information about what's happening. In, on the cyber security uh, front. Well, I appreciate that because I know in my district, and I go around, they, across the state of Ohio, uh, with the uh, folks that are tr uh, not only uh, producing the power but uh, uh, transmitting that power, the amount of time and energy and all that they're taking now is just because of the cyber threats that they face every day. And it's interesting when you talk to the customers out there, they don't realize what is being transferred over just to try to make sure that those threats aren't done. And I'm glad. And, and it's very important that that information is transmitted back to all these individuals and companies that uh, you deal with. If I could, in my last minute real quick, if I uh, may, I'm also very interested in the Energy Star program, which you may know had the appliance portion managed by DOE from 1994 to 2009. In 2009, the previous administration moved that the appliance manufacturers into having a dual management but split between DOE and EPA. And so these companies out there now are faced with duplicative reporting requirements and a lot more red tape that's added up to about $35 million annually according to the Association of Home Appliance Manufacturers. And just in my last 30 seconds, would it make uh, more sense and fit with the administration's go to cut that red tape to return that management back to DOE? I'm sorry, ask your last question again, sir. I was just well, with the, uh, would it make more sense to have uh, DOE with yeah. on the energy star and setting a split between the EPA and with uh, a DOE to have just being underneath the DOE? Yes, sir. I appreciate that answer. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Chairman, my time has expired and I yield back. Can I recognize Mr. Doyle for five minutes? Thank you. Secretary Perry, welcome back to the committee. You know, investment in research and advanced technologies, it's critical if we're going to reduce harmful emissions from fossil energy sources like coal and gas. Uh, and in your testimony, you mentioned your commitment to R&D, particularly for fossil energy. But the DOE budget cuts funding for fossil energy programs by 25 percent, including a 24 percent to the fossil energy research and development, which is vital. Uh, for funding the National Energy Technology Labs uh, in Pittsburgh and in Morgantown, West Virginia. Uh, Mr. McKinley and I had uh, sent a letter requesting a $100 million increase uh, in this category, and what we got was a $178 million decrease. Uh, i just like to say that, that what you say your goals are and what your budget says are, are diametrically opposite. And, and it's, it's puzzling to see where the commitment is. Let me also echo what Mr. Peters says. It is, it is craziness to eliminate ARPA-E. I mean, this is a program that's focused on high-risk, high-reward innovation, particularly when it's clear that the industry is not going to take on this kind of risk, and other DOE offices haven't quickly produced this type of early-stage, high-risk technology. Cutting this program makes absolutely no sense. And, and again, it's, it, it seems contrary to the goals that, that you state that the department has. Um, now, let me give you a compliment. Uh, I'm glad to see that your budget focuses on energy storage. 
Uh, I've introduced the Energy Storage Tax Incentive and Deployment Act to expand the investment tax credit to encompass battery storage technologies. I think that's a critical component needed to expand our use of renewables and strengthen our grid. So I appreciate your focus uh, on this initiative, and I look forward to, uh, to working with you on that. Um, let me ask you, Secretary Perry, yesterday, Exelon announced that Three Mile Island would prematurely retire in September. This means the loss of carbon-free baseload power, and it means the loss of a lot of good-paying jobs. Uh, and we know that as nuclear plants are prematurely being retired, this energy is being replaced by coal and natural gas, which is putting more greenhouse gases up into the air. Uh, now, I've had concerns with uh, the NOPR proposal or the first Energy 202C proposal, but I still support the nuclear industry because we can't meet our climate change goals and obligations without it. So tell me, what are other options that are available to address this issue for nuclear power plants across the country that are starting to close down prematurely? Mr. Dole, we um, totally agree with you on your, um, your observation about uh, you, you cannot meet your, your goals, no matter where you may land in the, in the, in the spectrum out there, uh, for um, the, the fight to um, reduce emissions without nuclear. So you ask what some of the options are, uh, and, and I think they're, they're twofold. Uh, one, having been a governor, uh, I think it, it would be uh, it would behoove the uh, the states that have nuclear plants to uh, look at whether or not they want to at the state level um, subsidize those plants. Uh, listen, the idea that uh, um, you know I, I don't necessarily think that the word subsidy is a is a bad uh, uh, term. Um, I, I I believe that you know it's up to the people to decide. Uh, do you want to have these? Uh, options, this diversity of energy sources, nuclear uh, is, I think, one of the most important ones. So th that's on the old plants that are there today and, and to uh, extend their, their life cycles. And those can be done, and they can be done safely. Uh, you know, how we deal with that waste is part yeah, but of Mr. But Secretary, the other side of this is it's beyond. It's beyond the ability of a lot of states to do what you're suggesting. And your responsibility as, as Secretary of the Department of Energy is for our national energy portfolio. And we know that nuclear is about 25% of that portfolio, and that if we start to lose, we're not building new plants because they cost so much money. Uh, if we start to lose existing ones prematurely, uh, our greenhouse gases go nowhere but up. I want to ask you one final question. Uh, we've sent a uh, uh, worker safety is a, a priority of mine, especially for workers employed in, in environmental remediation and decontamination because they have an increased risk of exposure to harmful subsidies. Uh, incorporating robotics into remediation for hazardous or radioactive material can not only increase the efficiency of remediation, but it protects workers also. What's the department doing in, to incorporate uh, robotics into uh, cleaning up sites? Yes, sir. Uh, we're, we're obviously working with that. As a matter of fact, we have some uh, uh, projects. Fukushima is one of those that uh, uh, the department is, is, is working with the folks. And we, I actually was over there uh, a year plus ago uh, to, to observe at the appropriate distance. I see uh, our time is up. Robotics. I want to respect Mr. Rush. So the Thank robotic you, side Secretary. of it, is, 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 we are working with that. And so our national labs are, are working with Sure, us. thanks and gentlemen. And the Chair now recognizes Ms. McMurray Rogers for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and welcome, Secretary Perry. I, I too want to join in applauding your, your enthusiastic leadership at the Department of Energy to lead the drive to a new American energy era. And energy innovation is the key. On this committee, we are regularly debating the best ways to promote new American energy. And today, because of American ingenuity, we're, we're celebrating energy independence. We're celebrating a booming economy, and we're also celebrating the fact that we are leading the world in bringing down harmful carbon emissions. In Eastern Washington, I'm proud to represent many who are on the forefront of these energy solutions, research and development of production and storage. Right now, there's an exciting partnership between Washington State University and PNNL. 
I just wanted to, to ask you to share some of the details, uh, some of the work that is being done at the Department of Energy right now on grid modernization space, uh, or within grid modernization, and how the work of PNNL is benefiting those efforts. I also, in that line, wanted just to ask you what you believe needs to be done to ensure that the United States remains on the forefront of innovation in grid modernization, and do you fear that other countries may ultimately surpass the United States in this field? Um, thank you. The, a, a great example of what we're, we're doing, I think, that, and, and it kind of goes to, you know, Mr. Peters, when, when you talked about RPE and my, um, and, I, and I do have a rather strong commitment to the, uh, the whole concept of private, public-private partnerships and, and working those together, and sometimes the, the budget doesn't uh, reflect the, the, the commitment uh, that, the, that I have, that the agency has, and through some of our cross-cutting, and this is one of the great examples of it, of the private sector working with us uh, at Idaho National Lab, for instance. We actually operate a, a grid out there, uh, the, a, a standalone grid where we can go in and break things and put viruses on and, and to, to really put uh, these uh, electrical grids to the test and, and, and we got, you know, very capable uh, private sector partners. And so, um, you know, one of the things we're focusing on is resilience modeling, um, you know, grid services that uh, um, energy storage uh, could provide for us in, in, in this case. So, um, you know, advanced sensors, there's, uh, um, you know, the institutional support that comes along with that. I think we've... I, th I think we've uh, some $200 million at DOE in, in FY16 through 18 uh, for uh, those types of, of, of services. And, and again, uh, the grid modernization initiative uh, is uh, something that we certainly support. Um, we have the uh, grid modernization uh, GMLC lab um, $40 million for some foundational work uh, from our applied energy program. So uh, the, we, we got multiple offices, and this is kind of our philosophy of, of uh, particularly on the area of um, uh, that ARPA-E and, and the folks that support ARPA-E and that concept of advanced research. This is a great example of uh, some of the foundational work that DOE is still involved with, and I think doesn't get counted towards ARPA-E's uh, conceptually, but it, it's, it's the type of cross-cutting management that we try to do at DOE that, that keeps these types of programs uh, alive and going, although the old ARPA-E um, structure, the, the money doesn't flow through it. So. Okay. Um, thank you. Uh, on Another note, I just wanted to give you, uh, others have brought up Hanford. Um, I wanted just to ask you in the time remaining what you believe could be done, should be done to ensure that the site is cleaned up in a timely and cost-effective manner. Yeah, and, and we're making some progress. I mean, the, 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 that was one of the biggest frustrations that I saw when I came to DOE was the massive amounts of money that had been done in the past. There hadn't been a baseline study done on that thing for, I think, the previous nine years. And we went in and did that, and it was a shocking amount of money that, that's going to be needed. Uh, but we're making progress. For instance, uh, I know Chairman Walden cares about that Columbia River, as do you. Uh, and the, the last reactor is going to be cleaned up. We're going to be able to go announce the last reactor in the basin of the, of the Columbia River uh, this fall. Uh, so th th that's some, we're, we're making some progress there, the high level. Uh, or I should say the, the low-level waste facility over there. Uh, I mean, we're ready to move some of that um, material out of, um, out of the region and, and go to either some interim or, you know, obviously I'm looking for some permanent waste sites uh, in this country as well. So I think we're making some pretty darn good um, progress out there. We, we got uh, a couple of those tunnels uh, now grouted and filled, and, and uh, so there's some good stories. It, it's going to be a long time. It's going to cost a hell of a lot of money. Okay. But thank you. We're thank making you. some good progress. And thanks for being here. I yield back. Five minutes. 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Secretary, for being here. Sure. You said a moment ago that sometimes the budget doesn't reflect the commitment you have and the agency has yep. to certain things. Yep. So how, how do we solve for that here? Because it, the budget is obviously reflecting something. And I, I guess you're in a, between a rock and a hard place, the rock being your personal commitment, if I can give you credit for that and wanting to invest in these things, and the hard place being orders that are coming from someplace else um, in the administration where that commitment is not as strong. So I'm looking at the Office of Energy Efficiency and Renewable Energy, which has done some great work over the years. I mean, I think the some of the estimates on the return on investment there are that it's netted about $230 billion for the taxpayers, which is just incredible. But the budget you've brought here today would cut that office by 86%. And then you look at the Solar Energy Technologies Office. Again, they've done terrific work. It's been an economic driver. Um, generating economies, employing over 240,000 Americans, $17 billion of investment in the nation's economy. I mean, these are award-winning numbers by any measure, helping to keep driving the cost, commercial cost of solar energy down because of the continuous attention and focus that that office brings. And that office in your budget would be reduced by 70 percent. Last year when you were here, we were talking about the importance of the Solar Energy Technology Office's work, how it was helping to make solar electricity more affordable. In Baltimore, we've been working on a project that DOE was a partner in to, to bring this opportunity to low-income homeowners create a workforce pipeline in the solar industry uh, for people in some of the hard-hit parts of Baltimore City, et cetera. So I guess the first question is, do you agree that this Solar Energy Technology Office um, has done good work and helps to improve affordability, reliability, and performance of solar technologies uh, on the grid? And how can they continue to do that good work if they're going to experience, according to the budget request you're making, a 70 percent um, cut in their resources? The, the short answer is yes, sir, I do think that they're, that office and, and, and the whole of EERE and, and, and what they do. Um, and uh, as a matter of fact, in March, we announced the largest ever solar funding uh, opportunity. It was $130 million dollars in new research to advanced early stage solar technologies. Speaking specifically to this, this uh, line item that you make reference to, the Solar Energy Technologies Office, uh, we had a FOA uh, reissue and it went through the process and on the 25th of March, um, we announced, um, I think, $36 million worth of projects there. So the there are two things that I'd like to just lay out for your consideration. One is, uh, you made reference to, and you're absolutely correct, the historic progress and the historic um, uh, wins, if you will, uh, that this uh, that uh, EERE has had historically. And now we're seeing the industry, both solar and wind, become substantially more mature, be able to stand on its own two feet, so to speak, and, and not be requiring the amounts of dollars that we had historically. So I, I hope there's some recognition about that the, the, the shifting of dollars has been because of the maturing of the wind and the solar energy. Uh, as a matter of fact, since 2016, since this administration's come into office, there's been a 90% increase in, in uh, the growth of the Let me Let me solar. just interrupt because I got five seconds. 
I, I understand the argument about it matures and maybe the investment doesn't have to be at the same levels. But I think if you maintain that investment, you'll keep us on the cutting edge. We'll be more competitive compared with our peers around the world than if we start to pull back from that investment. So I hope you will reconsider this as we move forward. And I yield back. Sir. The, chair, the chair now recognizes the gentleman from West Virginia, Mr. McKinley, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, and uh, Mr. Secretary, uh, welcome again back to this, and, and thank you. Uh, I'm just curious, there are a couple of several, th several things I'd like to run past you a little bit, um, because I liked your, I liked your opening uh, film clip about energy independence in the new era. Can you give us a perspective, however, of what's happening in New England? Because I don't know that we can suggest or, or should be offering that New England is energy independent, especially if last year in a Boston Harbor, there was an LNG tanker from Russia supplying, providing LNG gas to New England. And the fact that other New England states are, and across the country were importing uh, uh, 73 terawatts of uh, terawatt hours of electricity uh, from Canada. Um, that, that in and of itself, doing some rough math, uh, represents about 9% of the population of this country is getting its, uh, of America, is getting its electricity from Canada. Yeah. Uh, so could you address a little bit just briefly on that? Because I've got two other questions. Mr. McKinley, I'll, I'm, I think what you bring up here is really important. I touched on it a little earlier when uh, I, I think Mr. Plun and I were about having our uh, discussion. but. Being able to deliver energy, U.S. Uh, produced energy, to the totality of the United States is really important. What the President talked about in his executive order uh, on infrastructure was, I, I think, spot on, of, of focusing on uh, our ability to deliver the energy uh, all across this country. And, and by and large, that's going to be in the form of natural gas, it's going to be in the form of nuclear energy, and it's going to be in the form of, of coal-powered um, uh, energy flowing from, you but know, we're at the But we're at the discretion, unfortunately, as we're finding out, I'm, that's my second question, of how states are interacting with the 401 permitting process. Uh, we've got now four states from New York, uh, Washington, Maryland, and now Oregon has stepped in and said they're going to use this permitting, federal pr permitting process to prevent us from using fossil fuels or crossing fossil fuels in their state. I'm, I'm just wondering from where is the administration in the pushback uh, about this Commerce Clause? Is, is that troubling? Yes. The administration that... Yes, sir, it is. As a matter of fact, uh, the president talked about it yesterday uh, during the cabinet meeting, uh, Mr. Chairman. He, he brought it up. Um, you know, I, I get... And Sonny Perdue and myself are both former governors. Uh, and I wrote a book about the Tenth Amendment. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm kind of on the record of being a pretty strong uh, proponent of states being able to decide what's in their best interest. With that said, I think it does... Uh, beg the question, is it in America's national security for a state to block a pipeline uh, that is going to have an impact uh, from a national security standpoint? At that particular point in time, I, I think both the Commerce Clause and the, uh, the national security of this country trumps a state being able to stop uh, a pipeline going across for, for whatever reason that might be. So, is, is, and, and not even to mention what it's doing to the citizens of the Northeast from the standpoint when they're having to pay 60% more for energy, when the emissions are going up because they are having to use fuel oil instead of natural gas. I mean, not only are they affecting the, the environment in a very negative way, their citizens are having to pay more uh, expensive uh, energy. So, you know, this isn't just about this issue of, you know, is it okay for the governor of New York to stop a pipeline going across the state? The citizens of New York need to be engaged in this conversation as well about the cost of their energy 
And then all of the people of the Northeast need to be talking about, here's what you're doing to our environment because you choose to block a natural gas pipeline going across your state. Thank you. So I'm hoping the administration gets active uh, in joining other states that are trying to fight back against this. Uh, I know we've got the Crow tribe in, in Montana trying to ship gas or coal across uh, uh, the export it, and they're being blocked. Uh, but let me close with in, in the 10 seconds I have on it. Can you give us an update of what's going on with the uh, uh, status of the petrochemical complex in the Appalachia? I know the president sure. has called for a study to see if that's not something for energy uh, independence. It, it's, going, it's going forward. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. Let me remind Thank members. You. Thank you. Uh, you. Please be succinct with your questions. We have 18 members who have not asked this question, mm. and we have a hard uh, conclusion at 1230. Yes, sir. So. Please, the chair now recognizes Mr. McNerney for five minutes. I thank the chairman and I thank Secretary Perry for coming here this morning. I appreciate your diligence in running the department and also your passion about traumatic brain injury. I hope we get to work together on that yes, sir. issue. Absolutely, we will, sir. Well, um, I'm sure you can know that I'm not thrilled about the Department of Energy's proposed budget. 10% reduction in environmental management, 8% reduction in the Office of Science, 86% reduction in energy efficiency and renewable energy, oh my gosh, a complete elimination of RPE. Um, none of these are acceptable and Congress will create its own budget that looks a lot more like last year's, I'm sure you're aware of that. So tell me, how committed is uh, the Department of Energy and how committed are you to reducing carbon emissions? I, I think our record is, I'll stand on our record, sir, not only did I bring to um, the agency is my work as a governor of Texas, the uh, state that was reducing emissions uh, as much as any state in the nation, but this country is doing it as well. So we got a great story to tell about our emissions reduction. Uh, I, th I think we can help the world uh, by selling them American LNG and by getting our products and both not only our natural resources, but also our well, technology and our innovation. I mean, LNG sounds innovation. good, but LNG has fugitive emissions, uh, both at the wellhead and throughout the system. And, yes, sir. Uh, emissions of uh, natural gas are worse by a factor of 20, maybe, than carbon. So we have a lot of cleaning up to do. We're not there where we need to be, and I'm sure you understand that. Uh, let me ask you a question about cyber. Uh, I've introduced two cyber bills uh, on grid security with my friend Bob Latta, um, and that will promote a partnership with industry to mitigate physical and cyber uh, uh, risks. So how did the CSER office learn about the March 5th denial of service attack on the SCADA systems that affected Western states? Uh, and when did they notify the utilities to be more uh, watchful? Uh, well, we, we were in contact with the utilities and, and uh, I will suggest to you we have, uh, uh, we have, we, we have very timely, uh, I, I can't tell you, you know, time and hour, uh, at, at this particular point in time, I can get that to you as best I can. Uh, but uh, we, we not only facilitated uh, contact with the Department of Homeland Security uh, and their hunt and incident response teams in the, in the FBI. So is that how you um, learned about the attack? How did you learn about the attack? How did the Department of Energy learn about it? Our uh, emergency management uh, office was contacted. Well, it's clear that uh, industry should, we should work with industry, government okay. industry, to create public private partnerships to make the utilities more secure. And a desire to move on, um, as, as I mentioned, the budget would re cut renewable power office by 86%. That's disappointing to me personally since I spent a career developing in renewable energy. Specifically, however, the budget intends on ending the origination of new loans in the loan program office. However, Congress has repeatedly funding this office at over $20 million a year. Has the office continued to process loan applications and do due diligence on the applications and co as Congress intended? Yes. Good. Glad to hear that. Thank you. Um, nuclear. Succinct. We're, we're, we're following the, the chairman's. Making uh, progress, Mr. Chairman. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, nuclear waste. I've been a strong voice uh, in dealing with nuclear waste uh, that cites poorly. Um, that sit, we have nuclear waste, a lot of nuclear waste around the country sitting in poorly secured sites. Um, any solution, however, absolutely must work with nearby communities, which we've seen fail in the past. Uh, however, on October 10, 2018, the DOE issued a public notice about the way it interprets the words high-level nuclear waste. 
If this were suddenly reinterpreted or reclassified, then the DOE could dispose of it in, in less secure sites. Can you tell us how much high-level radioactive waste the department is considering reclassifying? Mr. McNerney, the, the, here I think what is, is really important for us to have a conversation about and be, you know, very open with the, uh, the this issue is about uh, identifying not where waste comes from, right. whether it's from a weapons program or whether it's from a civil nuclear program. And, and, and that's how we decide where this waste goes at this particular point in time. I think it makes abundant good sense for us to identify this waste by its, uh, by its radioactivity levels rather than where it comes from. And that's what we're talking about doing is being able to put waste where it needs to be based on its radioactivity and the strength of that radioactivity rather than where it came from. And that's what we're trying to, uh, Thank you, Mr. Secretary. to decide. Mr. Secretary, the Chairman, yeah, I recognize yeah, the gentleman from Illinois for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and Mr. Secretary. Thank you again for being here. Uh, I'm concerned about the news this week that our European and uh, NATO ally, Romania, is now seriously considering doing business with a Chinese state-owned enterprise, China General Nuclear Power Group. Uh, just this week, the Romanians signed a preliminary agreement with the Chinese to refurbish and build multi-billion dollar nuclear reactors in Romania. We have American companies vying for the project, but have been shut out by the Romanian government because of this growing Chinese influence in Bucharest. To make matters worse, these two new, new Romanian nuclear reactors uh, near the Black Sea sit merely 30 miles from Camp MK, where we have boots on the ground. Mr. Secretary, from a national security standpoint, do you have concerns with the Chinese investment in the energy infrastructure of our NATO allies, such as Romania? Yes. And luckily, the agreement between Romania and China is not yet finalized. So how can we engage with our partners in Romania to ensure that the bidding process for these projects is fair and transparent? Uh, we are we, we're headed back over in that part of the world uh, the first week of June. Uh, I was just back from Brussels meeting with the, uh, the Deputy Prime Minister of Romania this last week. Uh, we are in active engagement with our, uh, with our allies and our friends in, in the, the European theater on the U.S. Uh, in, in engagement on civil nuclear projects. Um, it's incredibly important for the future of uh, the U.S. civil nuclear industry to be engaged there, to be partners with them, uh, to develop the new technologies, uh, because if we don't, then at some point in time, uh, our and, and, and the challenges that we face in America today are pretty, uh, pretty abundant and, and pretty clear. Uh, when we've only got one project uh, that's, that's ongoing today, building a new reactor, it's why small modular reactors and the work that we're doing on funding those small modular reactors uh, is so important going forward. So, yes, sir. Excellent. Thank you. And uh, this question, I, uh, you can take as much time as I have left to answer it, but the U.S. is now predicted to be a net energy exporter, as you've well noted. That's a stunning turnaround from about 15 years ago when we thought our own resources were dwindling and we'd be forever reliant on foreign energy. U.S. sanctions on Iran's oil export, which come into full force this November, would not have been possible were it not for the shale boom in the U.S. I understand that you've been actively engaged with your counterparts in the world's major oil supplying nations and that you've expressed confidence that we can offset any potential disruptions in supply. How has America's energy abundance strengthened our hand diplomatically as we deal with global threats such as Iran, and you can even add maybe Venezuela into that? I, th I think most of us, even in this room, don't understand the, uh, the leverage that the United States now has. Uh, when I talk to, uh, for instance, our European allies at, in the EU last week, um, they understand, maybe better than we do, uh, the leverage that Russia has over those countries. Uh, the, uh, the, one of the reasons that the Russians fight our LNG coming into Europe is so that they can be the dominant source of energy to those countries. And uh, Ukraine will share with you uh, and other countries as well 
uh, that the Russians will cut off your gas supply if it's in their best political interest at any given time. So the U.S. and, and I, our, our message isn't you got to buy U.S. gas. Ours is there needs to be a diversity of supply, diversity of routes, and diversity of suppliers. And let me just say, you know, in, in kind of tail piggybacking on that, uh, I want to thank you for your leadership at the uh, European with the European Allies at the Three Seas Initiative Business Forum in Bucharest in September. I appreciate the department's recent creation of the Partnership for Transatlantic Energy Cooperation. Uh, I'd like to just mention in short uh, a bill that we passed out of the House, the European Energy Security and Diversification Act. Uh, in short, it would help both U.S. as well as European and Eurasian countries attain energy security diversification and improve supply routes and energy infrastructure through partnerships. Thankfully, it passed the House in March with overwhelming bipartisan support and it awaits action in the Senate. If the bill's enacted, I would just ask you to commit to working with Congress and the State Department and any other relevant agencies to coordinate a national strategy for European energy diversification. And, and Mr. Secretary, I deeply appreciate your service and your leadership, and I yield back my still remaining five seconds. Chair now no, no, recognizes uh, the gentleman from New York for 10 minutes. Thank you, Mr. For Chairman. For five minutes. <laughs> thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Secretary Perry, thank you for being here. Uh, I appreciate the work you're doing at the agency, although, like many of my colleagues, I do have concerns about the President's budget. Uh, Mr. Secretary, you've made a point to visit all of our national labs. Uh, and from a New York perspective, uh, focusing on Brookhaven, I can say the research being done is truly cutting edge. In recent months, we have been having a good bipartisan dialogue about how energy innovation can play a role in our nation's clean energy transition and contribute to greenhouse gas emissions reductions. In the past, you have testified that spurring innovation is a part of DOE's <clears throat> excuse me, core mission. Do you believe that DOE must continue to play an important role in funding RD&D yes, uh, to support the United States private sector in making innovative energy breakthroughs? Yes, sir. Well, we all agree that innovation can unlock tremendous opportunities, including creating jobs, empowering consumers, lowering energy costs, and reducing pollution. But in many cases, when we talk about innovation, we mean breakthroughs in less proven technologies. This requires riskier investments, and DOE can play an important role in shaving that risk. Um, we should also accept that not all research projects are going to work out. When it comes to research, failure is often a down payment on success. So, Mr. Secretary, setting aside the President's budget request, do you believe it is a good thing for DOE to make investments in riskier emerging technologies and processes, for example, the type of work done by ARPA-E? Yes, sir. ARPA-E is really the proven model for incubating innovation. I want to provide one example why I believe these investments are essential. Last year, ARPA-E initiated the DAYS project, which is focused on long-duration energy storage. In my mind, technology development and cost reductions in storage, particularly long duration, are absolutely necessary for us to achieve ambitious clean energy goals. So, Mr. Secretary, do you believe ARPA-E has played a constructive role in identifying energy challenges and helping to find solutions and foster innovation? Yes, sir. There have been programs that, uh, that ARPA-E uh, funded uh, that certainly made progress in that direction. Thank you. Not all of them. Thank you. We have other big challenges just around the corner. Low emissions industrial products, cleaner fuels for aviation and shipping, battery recycling and disposal, direct air capture technology development. DOE needs to lead the efforts in these areas, and I would be eager to work with the department and other members on these issues. Uh, now, I understand, you know, I heard your exchange with some colleagues about solar technology and the like. But I also want to focus on the role DOE can play in reducing costs to encourage deployment of existing technologies. For example, DOE has identified inc inconsistent permitting requirements and processes as a significant cost of residential energy installations. The patchwork of permitting requirements across thousands of local jurisdictions causes unnecessary delays and adds administrative costs. This, is not only increase, this not only increases energy prices for consumers, but also stifles homeowner and business investment in these technologies, such as rooftop solar. Other countries like Germany and Australia have sought ways to streamline permitting. 
The average cost of a residential solar installation, for example, in Australia is less than half the cost in the United States. So, Mr. Secretary, DOE and NRO have worked on reducing these permitting costs. Do you believe DOE or another federal entity can continue to play a role in helping to streamline the permitting process itself for residential energy systems? Yes, sir. Um, can you give us any examples of how they might be able to work with us, uh, well, the agency and, itself or others? Yep. And, and certainly I think uh, you all have a role to play in that as well uh, from the standpoint of um, analyzing where there may be some duplication of, of uh, effort, where there's some places that we can, uh, we, can, we can cut back on the regulatory side without there being a, a cost. Uh, the you know do cost benefit analysis of the rules and regulations that Congress puts into place. I think uh, you know having having been a uh, a member of, the, of of a legislature and having been a chief executive in a state, uh, I can assure you that uh, there's probably a legitimate conversation that can be had about federal regulations uh, and how those could be uh, streamlined. The president is focused on that. He's given all of us in in his cabinet a clear directive. Uh, to look at the regulations that you have where you can reduce the regulation uh, and obviously not affect the, the, the public safety or the, uh, the, the reason that was put there. If, if it was a good reason, leave them alone. But if not, reduce them. So well, we, I think there's some, some great opportunities that us continue to make progress on We that. look forward to working with you and NREL and uh, get the president to believe in climate change. Mm -hmm. so. Chair now recognizes the gentleman from Ohio, Mr. Johnson, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and Mr. Secretary. It's good to see you here you, today. You, uh, uh, several topics to talk with you about. Uh, you and I have discussed the emergence of uh, NGL opportunities within the eastern and southeastern Ohio region, a region of the country that has uh, become known as, as the Shell Crescent. Um, your department and others have put out Studies showcasing the economic advantages of investing in this region, where companies can build directly on top of the NGL feedstock, which can result in an increase of steady, reliable jobs. Uh, factors like market proximity also make this region an extremely compelling economic opportunity, as roughly 70% of North American polyethylene and 77% of North American polypropylene demand is within a day's drive of this region, my district. These two factors, among others, greatly lowers the production cost of ethane and polyethylene. So my question to you is what else can Congress or DOE do to ensure these opportunities are fully realized? I mean, uh, is there a need to increase our focus on workforce development or ensure smart regulations are in place to encourage the safe development of these opportunities, what else should we be thinking about or looking at? Yeah, certainly that's uh, uh, that's two of the areas that we should be focused on. Um, but the, uh, the the key here is to to put a plan together. There's four states in particular: um, your home state, West Virginia, Pennsylvania, and Kentucky, uh, that have extraordinary opportunity to. Uh, both deliver a, products to this country that are very important and the value added side of that that comes with that, the jobs that get created using the feedstock that you're actually sitting on top of. Uh, so th th this is not one of those where the government needs to go, here's X numbers of hundreds of millions of dollars. This is one of those, those where we need to tell those companies, look, government's going to get out of your way. Um, and, and I'm confident that those four states also have that goal as well. So you're, you're not at loggerheads with uh, the, the states in this case. You know, the, you know, we talked about some challenges with states relative to pipeline trans, uh, transforming or tra uh, transferring across their states. But this one is, we, d we don't have that, uh, uh, that type of, uh, um, we're gonna be sending Mark Menzies, who's our undersecretary, uh, in the coming weeks to meet with the, the states on these. So I think what those states need to hear is that the federal government is going to be a very good uh, partner. Uh, we're going to be not in their way. We're going to remove any hurdles that uh, uh, are, are there. So uh, uh, you know, we've obviously met with the folks in West Virginia already. We will come and uh, work with 
Ohio and Pennsylvania and Kentucky as well. I don't think there's a more important project in the U.S. than to see that development of a petrochemical, uh, a duplicative petrochemical uh, industry because the state of Texas could have a hurricane that could have massive impact uh, on that, uh, not only that region, but also that industry. We, we, we certainly agree on that, Mr. Secretary. We've seen studies that indicate uh, that as much as 45 percent of our nation's natural gas needs will be produced by that, uh, by that Shell Crescent region by, uh, by 2040. I mean, there's a, there's a lot of, there are a lot of energy resources there. Shifting gears just uh, uh, real quick, uh, you and I have also talked about in your budget funds a demonstration project that can help ensure we have a domestic enrichment capability for our emerging HALU needs, as, as well as a domestic enrichment capability to help meet our national security needs. You and uh, uh, Representative Kinzinger talked about that a few minutes ago. As you know, Piketon, Ohio, has a long tradition of helping the U.S. meet its national security needs by working on these domestic enrichment capabilities. Can you discuss uh, briefly the importance of this project and your budget request? Yes, sir. To, to, have, a, um, to have a stable, growing, uh, small modular reactor um, industry, uh, advanced uh, reactors, uh, we're going to have to have a uh, high assay, low enriched uranium um, source. Uh, obviously, at Piketon, uh, there is a project there that, that's that's working on uh, that. Um, I think the uh, the DOE is funding uh, uh, some of that effort there. All, every advanced reactor uh, under development is going to require this. So uh, having Having that access to that HALU uh, is very important. So uh, the department intends to contract with uh, Centris. It's in in, uh, well, in Piketon. So thank you, Mr. Secretary. The chair now recognizes Mr. Lomstein for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Chairman Rush, Ranking Member Upton, for holding this important hearing today, and thank you, Mr. Secretary, for being here today. Often when you're here. Uh, I note uh, that you and I have something in common, and that is all the wind energy that we produce in our respective states. We're doing more every day, and I thank you for supporting that, in, both in your sure. state and nationwide. It's very, very important. My home state of Iowa, as you know, leads the nation in biofuels production, and right now there's a significant concern in the biofuels community, which includes our corn and soybean farmers, surrounding the drastic increase in the number of so-called small refinery exemptions that have been issued under this administration. I think we've talked about this briefly before. Um, as you know, the small refinery waiver process requires that the EPA consult with the Secretary of Energy in the review of exemption petitions, and unfortunately, we still have essentially no transparency regarding this process. So my first question, Mr. Secretary, is has the DOE submitted its recommendations to the EPA for the 40 pending small refinery waiver, waiver requests for compliance for the year 2018. Yes, sir. April uh, 26th is okay. the, uh, the date uh, that we transmitted over to EPA. Uh, the, uh, I think there were 37 petitions. 37? Yes, sir. Okay. Thank you. Sure. I do appreciate that. Question two. Last month, Administrator Wheeler testified that EPA has taken the advice of DOE on all but one waiver application. Contradicting press reports, the EPA has disagreed many times in the past with DOE's recommendations. I'm talking about historically. Uh, please confirm how many times EPA's decision to grant a waiver request since 2016 has contradicted DOE's recommendation, if you could. Yeah. Let me give you the high level here. Sure. Um, I'll, I'll get I'll get back with you with with a specific number, uh, but you know we we give uh, guidance to EPA after analyzing a small refinery's uh, uh, petition to determine if there is a disproportionate economic hardship. Right. So you know there's I'll, I'll get you the specific number of times that we said. Yes, and they've said no. And I, and I realize it is supposedly refineries that produce 75,000 barrels. Uh, and, uh, and, and we have a lot of concerns, obviously, because we think it's 
much larger refineries have been granted these exemptions in the past as well. And this is a concern. It's a bipartisan concern that a lot of us have, especially in corn and soybean country. But I would like to request you provide us with a list of refiners that have received the waivers from the EPA in cases where DOE recommended a denial. And thank you for sure. providing that information. Uh, a number of companies that received waivers are publicly traded, as you know, publicly traded firms that report on the waivers they've received in their SEC filings. Uh, since the information from these companies is disclosed, at least to the SEC, why does the DOE need to treat similar information as confidential business information? Uh, clearly, it's not. Yeah. Can you answer that question? Let me get back with you on that. Okay. All right. That'd be great if you would. I'd really appreciate it. Um, fourth question. On April 12th, EPA released a request for comment on a proposal to make some information regarding small refinery waivers available to the public some information. However, it appears that EPA has walked back this proposal under pressure from the White House and the oil industry. And Mr. Secretary, was DOE consulted in the development of this proposal and in the decision to walk back this attempt to provide even a basic level of transparency? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm going to share with you that that's an EPA question. That's, uh, that, that one really is not in my purview. Uh, but we'd like you to clarify, if you would, um, whether DOE was consulted on that, and if you need to look into that further, that's fine. What, what, I, what I will tell you is that we, we get asked about the issue of seeing if there is a substantial hardship that right. these waivers would, that, that's, our, that's our role here. I'm, I'm not sure we get into the uh, area that you've just mentioned, sir. Well, we're just trying to track down, obviously, and provide as much transparency yes, as possible Absolutely. for what happens with these small refinery exemptions. Yes, and I know DOE does have a role to play in yes, all sir. of this. So um, uh, the transparency issue, we'll continue to follow up with you on that. Uh, just final comments I'd like to make. Mr. Chairman, the prolific number of small refinery exemptions issued has undermined the renewable fuel standards, caused significant demand destruction across the biofuel industries, and has hurt our farmers. The EPA under this administration has not denied a single waiver request and the number of refineries applying to be exempted from their obligation continues to increase each year despite falling rent prices. It's very frustrating, obviously. I'm gonna to continue to pursue this relationship that you folks have with the EPA on this issue, and I thank you for your testimony. And I yield sure. back, Mr. Chair. The Chair now recognizes Mr. Bouchon for five minutes, and the Chair will ask members if you could We've got about seven, eight members now. If you could quickly get to your questions, you don't have to use your entire five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm the an all of the above energy supporter, and Secretary Perry, thank you for being here. As you know, solar power electricity is growing at a rapid pace. According to the Solar Energy Industries Association, solar has ranked first or second in new electric capacity additions in each of the last six years. After reaching one million million solar panel installations in 2016. Two million installations are projected to hit in early 2019 and four million by 2023. In Evansville, Indiana, we have, have two two megawatt uh, universal solar projects and an additional 50 megawatt facility scheduled to be in operation by 2020. My point being, there are a lot of solar panels operating in the field today. I understand with the normal life expectancy between 20 and 30 years for these solar panels, it may not be on the forefront of many people's mind, but I worry about how we will properly, properly recycle and or dispose of solar panels at the end of their life cycle. Solar panels, as you probably know, harbor several toxic chemicals, including cadmium compounds, silicone tetrachloride, and lead, which if not disposed of or recycled properly can be harmful to the environment and extremely wasteful. As of right now, most solar panels in the United States at the end of their life cycle are landfilled unless specified by state law. Secretary Perry, is the DOE aware of any recycling procedures or guidelines in place today by either the manufacturers or the end users for when these panels reach the end of their life cycle? I'm, I am not aware of any at this particular point in time, and I think there's obviously some additional um, research that's going to be required to understand just how these systems um, are being handled, not only by the owners, but by the, uh, the waste management operations that they're going to end up in, you know, whether it's, or however they're going to be. Um, so uh, I, I think there's good, good points you make, sir, and, and I think uh, the national labs 
uh, and the private sector, and probably in conjunction with some states as well that have a, a preponderance of these, uh, finding a, uh, some public-private partnerships to work together and come up with some solutions. Because my understanding, the Europeans in Europe do have a uh, do have a process that, in, that is included in the, the manufacturing process that also, you know, relates to end of the life cycle disposal of those. And and right now, I'm working on draft legislation that would ask the Department of Energy, in consultation with EPA, to conduct a study on the environmental impact and analysis analysis of the disposal procedures in place for solar panels at the end of their full cycle. And is that, is, is that something that you think yes, the sir. DOE would, might be supportive of? Yes, sir. Yeah, because I do, I, thank you very much. I do think that it is important when we look at any source of energy, we look in, at the entire life cycle of that product. Again, I support an all of the above energy approach, but in this particular area, this is just one example, I think, where we're not looking at the entire life cycle and the overall uh, ec not only economic, but environmental impact of a way that we generate energy. With that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thanks, gentlemen. The chair now recognizes Mr. Welch for five minutes. Uh, thank you very much, and thank you, uh, Mr. Secretary. I want to ask you about uh, energy efficiency. I uh, want to ask you about uh, some impounded money uh, that would help on energy efficiency. And first of all, I want to say it's very dispiriting that we're not making the progress on energy efficiency that both sides know is really good. We can bring down carbon emissions, we can save homeowners and businesses money, um, and all of the efficiency measures usually requires local labor. So I know as a former governor, that would be very important to you. And I don't necessarily uh, think it's you, I just don't know what the stall is. Um, the administration has been consistent in its uh, efforts to strip funding from the ARPA-E program. Uh, and the GAO found that the, DO, that, that the Department of Energy was impounding funds from ARPA-E in 2017. And this is very concerning. Uh, the President budget proposed using $350 million of funding Congress had previously appropriated. Uh, to help the Office of Energy Efficiency and Renewable Energy in FY uh, 2020. And I know that the, the, the department has authority to carry over funds between fiscal years to support research efforts. Uh, but funding, and I understand funding delays can happen, uh, but it is starting to appear that this is much more like an impoundment. Can you address that and tell us how we're going to get that money in the pipeline? That's been appropriated. Go ahead, Mr. Secretary. Uh, yes, sir. I, I just wanted to make sure that you used the term impounded some dollars, and I, I, I want to, um, just for the, the community. No, I, I, it's looking that way to me. Yes, sir. All right? Yes, At sir. a certain point, it goes from repurposing yes. to. You're interested impounding. in the result, whether you use exactly. the word impoundment or whatever. That's and, exactly and I just right. I want to share with you from my perspective is when we came in, um, we, you know, I obviously, um, new administration, new to the job, and I wanted to take a look at these programs, and, and, and that's one of the reasons these dollars didn't flow. I'll take full responsibility. It was me getting up to speed on these programs, knowing where these dollars were going to be spent. Uh, with that said, uh, you know, th they now have been released and gone forward. Well, that, I'd like to see what those projects are, because my understanding is that, that money is not getting out the door, whether it's going to Mr. Bouchon's district or my district. Yes, That's sir. all intended to try to move, make progress yes, on energy efficiency. Uh, let me ask you about the appliance standards. There's always debate about that, and there's improvements in the uh, appliance standard program that can be made. Uh, Mr. Latta and I have been working to try to do that. But the bottom line here is these efficiency standards where you set uh, a requirement that all manufacturers have to meet have saved uh, homeowners and businesses a lot of money. Uh, and in fact, because there's been no action on these standards, like the light bulb standards, yes, sir. Uh, individual states like Vermont and now other states are adopting the federal standard and getting the benefit of that. Yes. But there's obviously an advantage all around if this is federal. Can you tell me what you're doing about these efficiency standards? Yes, sir. And, and here's what I would ask you, Mr. Welch. Let's 
One of the things that, that I found when I, when I got to the agency and we were looking at this specific was that I, uh, I think that the statute needs to be revisited. I think there's some, uh, I think there's some cumberness, cumberness this, that's been put into place. I think there's some, some hurdles in place. Right. I think. And, and I, I told somebody, I said, listen, the way this thing is written, because you can never back up a standard, is that you, I think there's more time being taken than needs to be taken on this because we're more interested in getting it right than we are getting it fast. All right, and, and, let me and, just make a suggestion. I am always open to improving the standard, okay? Perfect. And I'd be willing to work with let's, my colleagues and with you. But the standards have made a difference. Uh, you know, there's about 2.7 billion light bulb sockets where if we use those, it's going to save homeowners about 100 bucks a year. That's real money in Vermont. I know it is for some of your folks yes, in sir. Texas. Let's work on this together. But let's not kill the, any notion of standards because yep. we, can, we can make progress there. Yes, sir. And then I, finally, I don't think that's what, that's certainly not my intention. All right. Well, I'm going to follow up yes, your office. Finally, the DOE loan program, that there's about $5 billion in that. That actually gets out and works well. Uh, so let's get it out the door. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yes, sir. I yield back. This is the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Flores, for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Chairman Rush and Leader Upton for hosting today's meeting. Howdy, Secretary Perry. It's great to have you in front of the committee again. And uh, it's also great to have a fellow Texan leading the Department of Energy, a state that has uh, uh, done more than any other to reduce emissions, at the same time uh, becoming a leader in energy production for this country. Uh, that has done two things. It's made uh, the U.S. Uh, a net energy uh, exporter over time, and also uh, we are part of uh, the overall emissions reduction in the United States, which leads the world in emissions reduction among industrialized countries. So uh, three quick things. The first one uh, has to do with nuclear energy. You talked about um, the impact of small modular reactors, micro reactors, and advanced nuclear reactors when it comes to uh, helping to decarbonize the environment. Uh, as you said also, one of the essential elements of that is to have a new fuel, high SA, lower rich uranium, to do that. Uh, can you expand on the importance of HALU uh, to uh, be able to, uh, uh, be able to uh, put these reactors into service and also uh, the impact it has on decarbonizing the environment? Sure. Mr. Forrest, I think it's really important that, that we recognize that the project that we're working on in Piketon on the, the HALU uh, is the is the only domestically owned uh, source of, of halo so that's one of our reasons to uh, to, be, to be focused on that um, but these small modular reactors we we truly believe that that is the answer to being able to have a reasonably priced sustainable civil nuclear program in the United States right. so having that fuel available by a domestically owned company uh, is very important to I mean, without the fuel, then you're wasting your time with all of the uh, other work that you're doing. So, um, your 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 question about um, SMRs—they're uh, linked together. You can't have one without the other. The SMR programs are going to go forward. I've got a lot of faith in, uh, that that America will lead the world in uh, nuclear power, and. When we do that, we'll be able to sell this innovation to the rest of the world and be able to get old, inefficient, um, you know, greenhouse, massive producing uh, power supplies uh, out of the world's uh, fleet out there and doing our part to, not just for the United States, but for the entire world from the standpoint of, of emissions reduction. Mr. McNerney and I introduced legislation in the House that actually passed the House um, unanimously last year to um, help create that, that structure for HALU, and I'm hoping that we can do that again and also get it to the Senate, get to the President's desk. Um, I, your, your department provided good advice to us in terms of the structure of that legislation, so we hope to get that back on the table before too long. I'd like to talk about another issue to expand on what Mr. Bouchon was talking about in terms of the environmental impact of uh, silicon-based uh, photo uh, PV panels. Uh, that is a concern in terms of the environmental impact at the end of their lives. Um, you don't have to respond to this, just, just a question. Uh, people seem to think that lithium batteries are the way to go when it comes to trying to make intermittent sources of electricity 
uh, to make them part of a base load power supply. Lithium has a variety of environmental issues um, that uh, are part of it, as it, it, a part of the uh, end of life problems uh, when batteries are disposed of. And so I'd ask your department, if you would, to be looking at this in the future. I mean, it's going to be more of an EPA issue, but uh, the DOE is obviously going to have a, mm. a seat at the table. So keep that in mind in your future EPA plans. It probably has the, the back end of it. The front end of it is come up with innovative uh, ideas and new compounds so that the EPA didn't have a problem. Yeah, that's a good idea. I like that. So I yield back to balance of my time. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thanks, gentlemen. The chair now recognizes Mr. Serena for five minutes. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for being here, Mr. Secretary. I apologize, I was in another meeting, so dashing up and down. I'd like to take a little bit of time discussing uh, my favorite topic, the power marketing administrations, uh, and specifically the 2020 budget proposal. On page eight of your testimony, you state the budget proposes a sale of the transmission assets of Western Area Power Administration, Bonneville Power Administration, the Southwest Power Administration, uh, to reform the laws, how the PMAs establish power rates, to require the consideration, <coughs> excuse me, of market-based incentives, including whether rates are just and reasonable. This is exactly the same testimony that we had in the 2019 budget. Uh, and I think last year, when you came before the committee, we chatted about this a bit, and at the time you said, I'm reminded of a Kenny Rogers song, when he talked about you need to know when to hold them, when to fold them. Congress has been very clear about the issue. I'll be more than happy to carry the message back. So obvious question, Mr. Secretary, is were you able to follow up, take that message back, and was it just not received? Um, I, I can't answer whether it was received or not. It was given. All right. Well, I'll, I'll, I appreciate that, and I'm going to give you a little more ammunition. Uh, but I'll, uh, I'll go on the record one more time in saying that I suspect that the outcome is going to be the same this time as it was in 2018, 2017. Uh, Congress does have the ability to dispose of what the taxpayers uh, use of our I know how to salute, sir. Well, let me help you a little bit here. Uh, nine members of this committee, including my fellow Northwest colleagues, Ms. McMorris Rogers, Ranking Member Walden, have asked our colleagues in the administration to please reject this misguided proposal. Uh, as a member of the Northwest, uh, I remain concerned about the administration's continued insistence on this. Uh, it seems, uh, seems ill-advised for several reasons. It's a nonprofit federal wholesale utility and power marketer, receives no congressional appropriations, doesn't cost the taxpayer must recover its costs with revenues it earns from selling wholesale power and transmission services. Uh, BPA provides approximately half the electricity used in the Pacific Northwest, uh, operates three quarters of our high voltage transmission grid. Some of these assets would just fragment the grid, cause national security issues. Requiring BPA to sell at market rates would essentially be the death knell of BPA. The whole goal here is to have low cost energy, low cost opportunity for municipalities as well as our industry par partners. They sell the power at cost. That's an advantage economically uh, to uh, individuals and to businesses uh, in the Pacific Northwest. Uh, we've get, had some problems. Natural gas certainly is competitive, putting pressure on BPA, uh, Bonneville Power Administration. <laughs> Uh, and we also have increased cost uh, with mandated spill to take care of the fish and wildlife mitigation out there. Fully a third of our electric bill goes for fish mitigation. Without BPA, the federal government would be having to pick up those costs. And frankly, at this point in time, it's really exciting. Uh, Bonneville Power Administration has entered into this historic agreement with fish groups, industry groups, uh, municipalities uh, to share uh, the Columbia River. Uh, in a way that allows for increased marketing opportunities uh, to our neighbors to the south that require a lot of energy during different times of the day, during different times of the year, and yet allow fish passage uh, that heretofore has been a problem uh, with the dams in the river. So it's a historic opportunity to get us out of the courts and into the power generation business and into the fish passage business where every, all boats rise at the, at the, same, at the same level. So I just, I, I just ask us to ask you to do the easiest thing in the world, just leave us alone, you know, at yes, the sir. end of the day, sir. So, and with that, I yield back, Mr. Chair. Mr. Schrader, could I just share with you one thing? We just left Oak Ridge, and, um, and I'd like to bring to, to your office and show you some, uh, some technology there on new turbines for hydro that they're working on at, at um, our national labs in conjunction with the private sector. So I'd like to bring right. those to you. So, Excellent. Uh, some Chair, great. now recognize the gentleman from Michigan, Mr. Walmer, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, uh, Secretary, for being here. 
and uh, appreciate your work. Uh, appreciate very much the uh, increased dollars that have been put in for, C uh, for Caesar. I think it's an important function as we're considering this week in the House potentially a um, supplemental disaster funding package and potentially more hurricanes uh, coming in the season that uh, we can expect. How important is it that DOE have the resources to proactively plan for and deploy resources to respond to emergency situations and carrying out uh, this mission as the sector-specific agency for the energy sector? Yeah. Um, it, it, very important, sir. I mean, obviously, this is a um, this is one where the game never stops getting played, uh, where the bar never is it's moved higher every time we come up with a, a patch or a way to uh, uh, deflect the uh, those that would do uh, nefarious uh, deeds to our uh, our national security through our our electrical grid. They come up with a new uh, way to attack it. So it, it is a never-ending. Uh, th this is just as important as what the DOD does on keeping this country uh, safe through uh, the work that they do. I appreciate that. And uh, representing the Energy District for Michigan on the banks of Lake Erie uh, with nuclear and all of the rest, uh, we appreciate knowing that. Would DOE be better positioned to carry out these functions in the long term if the Assistant Secretary position responsible for the functions were made permanent in your organization? Yes, sir, I think so. Then let me cut to the chase and ask if you would commit to, to working with Chairman Rush and myself on our important legislation to elevate and ensure that these critical functions will continue to be led by a, an Assistant Secretary. In, in the appropriate way for me to participate, yes, sir. I appreciate that. I yield back. Sure. Thanks, gentlemen. Chair, now recognize the gentlelady from Arizona, Mr. Ms. O'Halloran. For five minutes. Gentlemen, gentlemen, I'm sorry. gentlemen from Arizona, Mr. O'Halloran, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, Senator, Secretary Perry, for appearing before the committee today to discuss the critical work underway at the Department of Energy to modernize and support our economy. Americans deserve access to reliable and efficient energy resources, and I firmly believe the U.S. should always strive to lead the world in innovation within the energy sector. It is no secret that solar energy technologies are rapidly advancing. It is also no secret that Arizona leads the nation in total days of sunshine per year. With the abundance of sun my state has to offer, we are at the forefront of the energy transition, and I'm looking forward to working on legislation that advances resilient grid-scale storage technologies. According to the Department's 2020 budget request, Energy storage can effectively buffer increased variable supply and demand in our electric grids. While the department has invested significantly in research for grid-scale storage technology, how will the proposed advanced energy storage initiative supplement other research across the department also related to energy storage? Yes, sir, Mr. Howler, I just Less than 90 days ago, we were out um, outside of Phoenix and or Tucson uh, at a Dell Well facility visiting that solar uh, top um, generated power that was going into the batteries. I mean, they uh, Arizona Power and Sur Power Sur APS uh, project out there. So they are a model for uh, some of the southwestern states uh, to to look at from the standpoint of generation and storage of electrical power. Thank you, Secretary. Uh, beyond research and tax incentives, are there other ways Congress could further help storage technologies become scalable into electric utility markets? Are targeted pilot projects with local communities a possibility? Yes, sir. Well, obviously, the work that's being done at uh, some of our national labs would be, uh, I totally uh, believe that the, uh, the the holy grail of battery storage will be found in the not too distant future, and I will suggest it will be a public-private partnership with a national lab, a DOE national lab, and some private sector partners. I'd be interested in visiting one of your laboratories also. Uh, while our energy market continues to evolve, I continue to maintain an all-of-the-above approach to energy policy. However, 
I am mindful of the impacts felt in communities when a coal-fired power plant closes. My district is home to the Navajo Generation Station, which is facing hardship. In fact, it's going to be closed. Its closure would simply devastate the Navajo and Hopi tribes. Uh, Secretary, uh, in terms of helping communities have access to and the resources they need for an economic transition of displaced workers in these dire situations, what role can DOE and Congress play? Uh, cut, cuts to uh, the private, pr tribal energy loan guarantee program are, are not going to help us. Um, yes, sir. I think one of the ways, and, and this gets back to uh, uh, Chairman Rush's effort on clean energy jobs, the transition, uh, if, if that plant, if the decision is made to shut that plant down, I think the, uh, the focus on uh, the diversity of that workforce and being able to, uh, to, to bring those individuals into some of the clean energy jobs is one of the alternatives that we can do too. Uh, and, and the other side of it is that, that hopefully the innovation that you're gonna see out of uh, the, again, DOE labs dealing with uh, the, the usage of coal and the technologies that come with that can keep that plant going and, and uh, be able to be a source of, of energy and a source of innovation for, uh, for the country. It'll be interesting to see what those programs look like since the plants are scheduled for closure across the entire western yep. United States uh, fairly quickly uh, within the next 10, yep. 10 years. Uh, thank you, Secretary, for providing your insight into these critical issues facing the energy sector. As a member of this committee, we will continue to work in, on ensuring the department continues to advance American leadership in energy policy. And I, I look forward to trying to understand uh, the entire department's uh, focus uh, on renewables and the ability to uh, uh, address the uh, and considerable impact climate change has uh, yes, in our society. Yep. And thank you, Secretary. Thank you, sir. Uh, Mr. Secretary, I know you have a hard stop. I know you have a hard stop, Mr. Man, at 1230. We have three more members. Can you indulge us? If they will be brief, can you indulge us? And, and I'll uh, be brief too, sir. All right. Promise. Uh, Chair, I recognize Mr. Duncan. Thank you. Thank you, Secretary Perry, for being here, and thank you for taking some extra time. I know you had a hard break. Um, back in March of this year, President Trump released an executive order on coordinating national resilience to electromagnetic pulses. A key component of the President's strategy is enhancing grid resiliency and hardening, which uh, you mentioned in your testimony, and I couldn't agree more. Securing our nation's electrical grid infrastructure is vital to our nation. But down in Charleston, South Carolina, Clemson University, go Tigers, uh, and... Um, Private partners like Duke Energy have established the um, eGrid facility. It's uh, providing a platform for innovating and validating and testing multi-megawatt electric grid components and real grid conditions without the risk uh, to the wider grid. This capability is needed to facilitate rapid introduction of new technologies in our grid system. There's no other facility in the country with the capabilities of the Clemson Duke Energy eGrid, and the project is way ahead of anyone else in the nation. I believe grid resiliency is critical to our national security, but I'm also a fiscal conservative, and I don't believe we should duplicate uh, tax dollars and spending. The obvious choice for completion of the test bed is at the eGrid facility in Charleston in conjunction with Clemson University. It's the most efficient and effective use of taxpayer dollars. Secretary Perry, are you familiar with the work being done at that facility? This, uh, yeah, this North American um, energy reliability and resiliency model, I think it's a $30,000 um, program that I'm looking at here on, uh, excuse me, 30 million. I missed it right. by a few zeros there. Um, have you visited that facility? No, sir, but... Uh, I know it's Clemson University, and I know the I'm, Texas A&M, Texas but I want to invite you to come. Texas A&M is playing Clemson this fall, so that seems like it <laughs> might be a good time for me to come visit. What do you think, sir? I look forward to hosting you in South Carolina and hopefully uh, down okay. in Charleston for that. I've been there before. I um, hope the outcome is different than it was the last time we were there. Right. I'm speaking from a Texas A&M perspective, of course, sir. <laughs> um... Let me ask you, let me shift gears, because I want you to come down to Charleston, and we're going we're gonna to make that happen, because it's important for our nation. The threat of natural or man-made EMPs and just where our, our grid system is, this is a vital component. There's also a drivetrain facility, which you'll see testing all of the wind turbines 
um, for all the dynamics that the wind can put on those. It's a neat facility. I was down there Tuesday, and you'll find it fascinating, and you'll understand how important that is to the nation, just like H Canyon is at Savannah River site. And I know, uh, I think you visited the Savannah River site. H Canyon is chemical separation facility. It's vital to pit production. Yes, uh, new missions at the Savannah River site that I know you support. Uh, the transition from MOX over to pit production is important. You've mentioned that. Uh, I want to tell you I stand with you on that for the folks down at the Savannah River site. In the essence of time, I just want to mention one last thing. It's something you and I agree with. A national solution, a national problem, and that's Yucca Mountain. 121 sites around this country currently hold commercial uh, spent fuel. Uh, we also have defense waste sitting at uh, places like Savannah River and Hanford. Uh, Yucca Mountain is the law of the land, and uh, I support the Nuclear Waste Policy Amendments Act. I know you do as well. I look forward to working with you and John Shimkus and others um, to get Yucca Mountain back on track. And I want to give you an opportunity to comment on either Yucca Mountain or anything you'd like to for this last uh, couple of seconds. Yes, sir. We spent eight billion dollars on Yucca Mountain. We spend two million dollars a day keeping it right here. That's the plan right now, and I don't think that's what Americans want to see. I think they they want to have a permanent repository. The law of the land today, you're correct, is Yucca, but we can't get an answer on whether Yucca is the right place or some other place is the proper disposal site unless we have the permitting process going forward. So not only so we can stand up in front of Americans and say we found a solution to this $2 million a day problem that we've got, but also here's our solution to it. Here are the sites that we need to look at. And we can't do that unless the permitting process at the NRC goes forward in DOE. I'll just remind this committee that um, ratepayers paid for the construction and, and uh, operation fees for Yucca Mountain. In South Carolina, that has amounted to $1.3 billion, not tax dollars, ratepayer dollars, in the same way in all the states. This nuclear waste is sitting on the shores of Lake Erie in Ohio, sitting on the shores of Lake Kiwi in South Carolina, and other places that we don't want to see anything negative happening. Yucca Mountain is a national solution, a national problem, and something we need to support the Secretary on and get Yucca Mountain back because, as he said, and I have said, it's the law of the land. And with that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Chair now recognizes the gentlelady from California, Ms. Berryman, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Secretary Perry, in 2017, the Department of Energy finalized and published a comprehensive policy to incorporate environmental justice into the decision-making process at the department. Secretary Perry, do you know what environmental justice means? I can tell you what it, I can tell you what it means to me. What does it mean uh, to you? Environmental justice to me is uh, being able to play a, an electrical rate uh, that I can afford, uh, and at the same time knowing that the emissions uh, are, uh, are not going up because of a decision that's made. Um, I, I see environmental justice being uh, attacked uh, every day uh, when the folks in the Northeast have to pay an exorbitant amount of money for the cost and the emissions are going up. To me, that Mr. would Secretary, be a I, social and a economic injustice. Okay, Mr. Secretary, um, I represent a district that's a majority minority. It's 88% Latino African American. They disproportionately um, have the burden of injustices that are happening from air pollution, from the lack of efficiency, um, not investing enough in energy efficiency, but let me tell you, your own report here says the Department of Energy defines environmental justice as, quote, fair and treatment, the fair treatment and meaningful involvement of all people with respect to development, implementation, and enforcement of environmental laws, regulations, and policies. That's directly from this report here um, from your department, and your photo is right in the front here. So um, what progress has your department made in achieving these goals in the two years since it was published? Um, I would suggest we're making progress. Okay, well, you know, that's, that's not a very specific answer. I would like to know what specific progress you're making. Just to help remind you of the goals here, goal number one says to fully implement Executive Order 12898, the federal actions to address environmental justice in minority populations and low-income populations. Um, goal number three says to minimize climate change impacts on vulnerable populations. Many of those populations are just like my district, low income, communities of color. 
And I would like, if you could, please, to make sure that you follow up with me on what progress your department has made. Um, unfortunately, your answer, just that you're making progress, uh, doesn't help yeah. us well, know what it is you're working on. Can I, can I expand then? I'm, I'm just trying to follow the chairman's lead and be as concise as I can be. Uh, when you look at what the United States is doing from the standpoint of, of uh, reducing emissions, I think that goes right to the heart of what you're talking about. That goes right to the heart of if, you're, if your constituents uh, if care about the emissions going down, the United States and what we're doing with liquefied natural gas. As a matter of fact, uh, I would think it would make sense to go across the state of California and export that gas um, off, off the West Coast somewhere so that it can go and, and impact the rest of the globe somewhere. So all of those things collectively, I think, go to the heart of what you're talking about from the standpoint of environmental justice. Uh, and if we're going to be serious about this, we can't block a emission-reducing uh, fuel like natural gas from going across New York into the Northeast. Okay. You can't block that type of, of fuel going uh, across your state to, to keep it from going to somewhere in the world. I mean, you, you can't on one hand talk about environmental justice and then say, oh, but we can't send any of this fuel across our state because, it, you know, for whatever reason, we don't like that particular Mr. Fuel. Secretary, will you commit to giving me in writing something about what you're doing on environmental justice in your department um, to just supplement what you've said here today? Sure, absolutely. Um, that, that would be great. I just want to. I just want to say, look. I know a lot of my colleagues have talked about the cuts um, to research and development. I'm a firm believer that we need to fund adequately fund um, investment in renewable energy programs because if we don't, it's going to put the U.S. at a geopolitical disadvantage, considering how aggressively some other nations are phasing out fossil fuels. Um, and I think there's a great tie here in environmental justice. And given time. Um, maybe we can have this conversation another time. We'll do it. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. Thank you. Ms. May, and you and I recognize the gentleman from Virginia, Mr. Griffin. Thank you very much, Mr. Secretary. I know it's been a long day. I apologize that I have not been here for the entire hearing. I've been upstairs working on uh, trying to figure out ways to lower drug prices in another uh, subcommittee, and that's important as well. You're doing great work. We appreciate you. It's one of the, when you come to testify, it's usually one of my favorite days, so I really do regret that I have not been able to be here all day. And I would just have to say that there's a lot of great stuff going on there. I am concerned about cuts to research. I think there needs to be uh, more money on research, but that needs to be a parity between our fossil fuels and making sure that we're finding the best ways that we can use them. As you know, the rest of the world is not going to stop using fossil fuels even if we do. And one of the things that's interesting is a couple of years ago, you all gave a, uh, a research grant uh, for trying to separate rare earth minerals from coal. Yep. Well, here's what's happened. It's just been really exciting. And I've just learned about this in the last couple of weeks. So I've been talking about it everywhere I go. They haven't got that perfected. In fact, Dr. Yoon at Virginia Tech, who I greatly respect, said they weren't ready to go to phase two that DOE was working on. They were hoping y'all might go to phase 1.5 on that. But they've licensed that technology to steel mills in India. Why? Because as a part of their research, they're separating things from coal and they can separate out the dirtier coal from the cleaner coal, the higher carbon coal. And now we've got steel plants in India that are gonna use that technology to get a higher grade of coal to burn, to make their steel, which means that they are lowering their carbon footprint because of technology financed in part by the Department of Energy at Virginia Tech and other places, and that's progress. When you say we're making progress, I don't know how you could ever list out everything that you all are doing because as we work as a nation, both on renewables and on fossil fuels, to make it better, to burn it cleaner, to do more, we are going to find things that benefit the rest of the world as well, and we should be able to export that. I congratulate you on that. Are, are there any things that you all can do to help us uh, export those technologies as they come up? Because when we're dealing with climate change and we're talking about CO2 in the atmosphere, we're not talking about just the United States or the state of Virginia. By the way, thanks for stealing our coach at Virginia Tech, my district. But that's all right. At Texas A&M <laughs> in basketball. But, but, but good man. But we can, he is a good man. But we can, we can do a lot for the world if we'll export 
um, American technology yep. to the rest of the world so they can lower their carbon footprint. Because the Indians are going to burn coal no matter what. The sub-Saharan African nations have plenty of coal. They're going to burn it. What say you? Absolutely. And, uh, and is there anything that you can do to help us export that technology uh -huh. as we come up with it? It's, it's really interesting, as I was having uh, the discourse uh, previously, and we were talking about uh, uh, our, our, our European friends who are getting out of the, uh, the, the natural gas, they're, or no, excuse me, not now, they're getting out of the, the coal, uh, they're going to all renewables, et cetera. Uh, and, you know, they criticize us for leaving the Paris Accord, uh, yet what I tell them is I said, when you all have the reductions in emissions that the United States have, then you can lecture me about getting out of the Paris Accord. But until you do that, please don't. And then when you close the door, they say, and by the way, how can we buy some of that LNG? So, I mean, they get it that it's the United States' ability to deliver liquefied natural gas. It's our ability to de deliver technology like you're talking about uh, to help uh, lower emissions around the world. That, I will suggest, is the absolute definition of environmental justice. And you're absolutely right. And as a part of that, we also keep rates low. I thank you very Indeed. much, and I yield back. Mr. Secretary, for your participation in today's hearing, and we will um, now, Mr. Secretary, I know you have to leave. We really, you really was gracious with your time, and thank you so very much for your participation. Thank you, Mr. Thank Chairman. You. Now, the Chair I want to remind members that pursuant to committee rules, they have 10 business days to submit additional questions for the record. To be answered by the witness, uh, who have appeared and I ask Mr. Secretary if you will respond promptly to any such questions that you may receive. Uh, the chair has uh, a unanimous consent request to enter into the record the following uh, submissions. A study from the Brookings Institute entitled Advancing Inclusion Through Clean Energy Jobs. <clears throat> A report by the Solar Energy Industry Association entitled Diversity Best Practices Guide for the Solar Industry, and an article from the Alliance to Save Energy entitled Growth in Energy Efficiency Demands Investment in Highly Skilled Workforce. Here are no objections, so ordered. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. And the committee now, some committee now stands adjourned.